The story opens in the dazzling dunes of Africa. A few green trees surrounding the place make a few shady spaces available in scorching weather. Some armed individuals from anti-government forces are walking in the conflict zone. Two soldiers, hiding behind a boulder, wonder, seeing these individuals with weapons. One of them asks the other where these anti-government forces get the guns. The other one curses these guys. Then he lies down on the ground, puts a hand on his chest, and says to his comrades that only three are left, and all the others are already down. The other one, drenched in sweat, becomes worried to see his companion in a miserable condition of hopelessness. The first one shares his fears with his companion that it will harm them if things continue like this. He then asks his fellow if they should retreat. The second one supports his comrade in getting stable and says they should not think about quitting. Meanwhile, their captain arrives and tells them he will advance and lead the attack. He is the fifth captain of a particular country Overseas Expeditionary Forces 1st Ligon's 5th Squad, Hasumi Rijui. He is a courageous man with a strong determination for success in his eyes. He hides behind a giant boulder and checks out his enemy forces. He tells his subordinate soldiers that they require JTLS, CTLS, and KTLS to join their discord to apply. One of the anti-government forces men notices that three people are hiding behind a boulder, and a man is hiding behind a tree. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui thinks that he will make a quick detour to go around and try a surprise attack on the enemies. He looks at the enemies from a distance who are standing unaware and attacks them. He jumps onto one of his enemies and hits his head with a heavy punch. He gives them an angry look and jumps onto the other one. He swings his hand and punches the other one in the neck. He knocks down two of the enemies in the blink of an eye. The third one looks terrified, seeing Hasumi Rijui beating his companions wildly. He takes his aim with his gun. On the other hand, Hasumi Rijui takes out his pistol. Hasumi Rijui aims at the enemy and shoots him right in the forehead between two eyes. He stands calmly with one of his feet on the back of a head enemy. He then takes out his walkie-talkie and informs his team that the subjugation has been completed. He ties three of the unconscious enemies with a tree. One of them awakes and Hasumi Rijui asks him something. Meanwhile, one of the soldiers arrives and tells Hasumi Rijui that the corpses of the dead enemies have been disposed of. Hasumi Rijui tells his soldiers that the enemy's base is on the other side of the jungle. He tells them they will finish the survey before the day ends. The subordinate soldiers salute him and say yes to his instructions. He takes his squad with him and moves through the forest. One of the soldiers says to Hasumi Rijui that he thought this was a problematic military operation to pull off, but as expected of him, he made it through. Hasumi Rijui looks back and asks the soldiers why he is praising him suddenly. He says to his companions that a courageous man without the fear of death and with strength can achieve anything. The soldier says he is also a man of superior intellect. He then asks the captain when he learned the local language. Hasumi Rijui stays quiet at this question. One of the soldiers laughs and says that he thought the Japanese people were all about peace and eventually grew weak, but the captain is different. He adds that his name, the modern era's strongest, is not without any reason. It is commonly known in Japan, a peaceful idiot is someone who is used to living in a relaxed environment and loses the power to fight back. Hasumi Rijui stops and says to them they are mistaken about one thing. He adds there is no way that he would not be afraid of dying. He clinches his hands into fists and says that earlier, he judged that the attacking side would make them able to survive. Hasumi Rijui's words make other soldiers wonder. They look towards each other. He asks them to be alert and tells them they will soon reach their target destination after hearing nothing from their subordinates. He looks back at them and asks them what happened. Meanwhile, he steps into a highly foggy place. He wonders about seeing fog in this place. He feels that it is poisonous. He tries to figure out what it exactly is. He finds himself in a strange place and asks himself where he is. He feels like he is in a cave and tries to remind if there is any such place nearby. He thinks about checking the map. Meanwhile, he hears something calling that he welcomes the hero from another world. He asks the man if he is from the anti-government forces. Hasumi Rijui becomes alter and checks his weapons. He notices that his pistol has gone and his other weapons and equipment have also disappeared. He says oh shit, he is only left with his knife now. The voice again says that he doesn't have to be on guard. The voice introduces itself as a divine heavenly voice and tells him it will guide him. Hasumi Rijui wonders to hear this. The voice says that it will show him the status window. Soon, a screen appeared in front of Hasumi Rijui. 
Hasumi Rijui's name, job, HP, MP, race, status, and skills appear on the screen. Hasumi Rijui wonders what this thing exactly is. He thinks about how his date is floating in front of him in the middle of the air. He taps his forehead and thinks, damn it, if he is going crazy or something. The voice replies that this is not the case and tells him this is normal. The voice says that in his world, this sort of thing is average in the form of the game and asks if it is not so. Hasumi Rijui replies that he does not know. He says that he has not played any games. He adds that up till now, he has never had any of this type of luxury. The voice asks him if he is familiar with the words like, summon to another world. Hasumi Rijui folds his arms in front of him, says that he has not heard about it, and asks what this is. The voice says that it can understand. Hasumi Rijui tries to know if it is a person's voice. The voice asks him to be quiet and says it will explain everything from the top. Hasumi Rijui sits on his knees on the verge of a hill and looks down to observe something. He notices some people in a place that seems blazing with a fire. The people try to protect themselves from the fire flames. He checks out them and says that the people are wearing strange attires and speaking a language that he has never heard before and cannot comprehend. A yellow dragon appears. With his appears another status window. Words like status window, magic, and another world pop in his mind. He tries to understand the scenario. He says that their method could be better. He looks down on the people again. He notices them attacking the yellow dragon with the fire flames. He thinks that attacking the dragon's exterior does not harm him. The dragon proceeds toward the people. One of the people wonders why this monster is so brutal. He thinks they should retreat before their magical power runs out. Then he feels that several people will be sacrificed if they do so. Hasumi Rijui asks them why they are not attacking the dragon's abdomen. The man asks him where he comes from. He replies to him that it does not matter. Hasumi Rijui notices that their language is similar to Spanish and Portuguese. He wonders if there are also some of the elements of the French language. He feels like he can communicate with them. He tells the man that it will work if he goes close to the monster and attacks his abdomen. He asks him why he is not doing so. The man wonders at his question and says that no one will do that dangerous task of going close to the monster. He adds that it is not customary to slow down the HP of the monster with the use of magic the way they are doing. They again attack the monster with the help of their magic. Hasumi Rijui asks him if they will continue like this and if the members will use all their strength. He raises his finger and says that if he thinks like this, he should help them. The man says to Hasumi Rijui that he must also be an adventurer if he is here. Hasumi Rijui closes his eyes and says all right. One of them says they will lose all their strength if they go on like this. Hasumi Rijui stands beside the people in the fight against the monster. The people notice that Hasumi Rijui is just at level 2. They see him approaching the monster and say it is dangerous to go close to a low-level beast. Hasumi Rijui replies that it is not a problem at all. The monster opens its mouth and growls. Hasumi Rijui notices the poisonous fangs of the monster. He stands near the monster calmly. The monster proceeds toward him. Hasumi Rijui jumps to change his position and plans to attack him from behind to avoid the poisonous fangs of the monster. The monster takes out his long tongue. Hasumi Rijui jumps onto him and punches him. Meanwhile, the monster's tail hits a rock and tears it into pieces. Hasumi Rijui notices that the monster's tail packs quite a destructive power. The monster opens his mouth and growls. Hasumi Rijui tries to avoid the hit of his tail. The monster's tail hits the mountain and causes big cracks in it. Hasumi Rijui jumps at the monster and says it is fine if he does not get hit by it. The monster shakes his body and throws him away in the air. The monster growls wildly. Hasumi Rijui falls and sighs. One of the men comments that the guy is unbelievable. Hasumi Rijui looks at the monster and says the monster is probably forced to rampage to shake him off. He gathers his strength and jumps back onto the monster. He aims at the monster's abdomen and says that part is defenseless. He takes out his knife and thrusts it into the abdomen of the monster. The blood gushes out of the monster. Hasumi Rijui's eyes spark when they see this. The monster growls and tries to maintain its balance, but in vain. The monster emits a sharp light and everyone covers their eyes. The monster falls to the ground. Hasumi Rijui walks toward the people holding a knife drenched in blood. The people wonder if he has defeated the monster with only a knife. This victory is something unbelievable for them. 
As Hasumi Rijui comes toward them with blood stains on his uniform, one of the men asks him who he is. Hasumi Rijui says with a firm tone that he is just a soldier. Night befalls. The dead body of the monster remains on the ground. In the darkness of night, everyone notices something emitting yellow light. Hasumi Rijui goes near to this. He sees that it is a coin with a sword carved on it. He first touches it and then picks it. He takes it close to his eyes to check out. Meanwhile, his status window appears and shows that he has leveled up. He clinches his fist and looks at the status window. The window further indicates that his maximum HP and MP have increased. Looking at his status window, he notices a change in the numerical value. One of the men thanks Hasumi Rijui for saving their lives. Hasumi Rijui tells him not to think much about it. The girl asks him who he is. The girl says he told him earlier that he is a soldier but does not look like a soldier of the kingdom's army. Hasumi Rijui tells her that he is a member of overseas expeditionary forces. He then stops momentarily and wonders if they even know what he is talking about. He cuts the information in short. He tells the man that he cannot tell him the details, but in short, he carries out rescue missions to save human beings. The girl replies let these things be. After all, he is pretty strong. She asks him if he wants to go with them. Another man comes forward and says that he is against this decision. Another man says not to let a man join them who is not even an adventurer. He asks them to leave that place alive based on their strength. She again asks if anyone else is against this. He says he expects these people to bring forth alternative plans. The girl says to Hasumi Rijui that he again extends his invitation in case no one is against this thing. She asks him if he will join hands with them until they reach the final dungeon exit. Hasumi Rijui accepts his invitation. Meanwhile, some other monsters attack them. Hasumi Rijui attacks those creatures. One of the men opens a book on magic and tries some magic to burn them. Together, they succeed in fighting against the creatures. They say to Hasumi Rijui that he is solid indeed. One says they are so lucky to have a lifesaver like him. He adds that they could be eradicated if they were careless. Hasumi Rijui asks if this place is that dangerous. The girl replies yes and tells him that although it is just a D-rank place, it is the second lowest one. Hasumi Rijui asks him what the rank is about. The man wonders and asks if he does not know about the rank. One of them tells him not to act on every little detail. The girl asks him to ignore their comments. Hasumi Rijui says he does not particularly mind. The girl also tells him that the dungeons have ranks assigned to them by the Adventurer's Guild. She tells him the order goes backward to the A rank, starting from the lowest E rank. On the E rank, there are snakes and scorpions to deal with. On the D rank, there are dragons like monsters to deal with. On the C rank, there are wild, tiny monsters. There are some high-level monsters on the B rank, and on the A rank, there are dangerous magicians to fight with. She tells him that the S rank, legendary rank, and mythical rank also exist, but they are special ranks. She tells him that the lizard cave from earlier is a monster that only appears in C rank dungeons. She adds that these things happen from time to time. Hasumi Rijui says that he does not even know about the dungeons in the first place, but they must be where creatures like snakes and scorpions appear. She further tells him that when a dungeon creature or a monster dies, it vanishes into the thin air. After that, an item of some kind will fall on the ground. Hasumi Rijui thinks that an adventurer's job is to collect these dropped items. He thinks the thing in his hand is probably one of these items. He takes out that coin from his pocket and shows it to her. She tells Hasumi Rijui that it is a weapon summoning coin. Hasumi Rijui asks if it is a complex coin. The girl tells him no, he cannot use it as money. She says that coin-shaped items can display various kinds of effects depending on their type. She tells Hasumi Rijui that the weapon summoning coin can summon a weapon that he has used in the past. Hasumi Rijui says this is quite a valuable and convenient item, but it is okay for him to keep it. She tells him that it is his right to keep it. After all, he is the one who defeated the lizard bastard. One of the men laughs at him and says that no such adventurer would be so thankful for an insignificant item like this coin. The man tries to provoke him and asks if he wants to go against him. Hasumi Rijui ignores him. He calls him a coward for ignoring him. Hasumi Rijui thinks they are calling it insignificant because they use magic and do not use conventional weapons. He says they must not have any weapon to summon with the weapon summoning item. He says that coin will work as a trump card for him. They soon encounter a giant snake. 
Hasumi Rijui takes out his knife and attacks that snake while others use their magic. However, he succeeds in killing the snake. His status window screen shows that his MP and HP have increased. The heavenly voice tells him that he has leveled up. He gets irritated and says that it is so noisy. He tells the divine voice that he can hear him if he does not shout. His companion hears him murmuring and asks if something happened to him. He tells her that the heavenly voice, or whatever it is, is quite noisy. She asks him in return what the divine voice is. He says it is nothing, and tells her not to worry about it. He wonders if he is the only one who can hear that voice. He then thinks, what the hell is this voice about? The heavenly voice asks him to leave it aside for the moment. Then the voice asks him to look at his surroundings as he has reached a vast space. They all walk under the starry sky on a vast space. They think that after coming this far, the exit must be very close. Hasumi Rijui notices something. He tells everyone to look up and asks them to run away. They are attacked by fire flames from the sky. One of them says this cannot happen. One of them says they are in the d rank dungeon. What the hell is a dragon doing here? People seem terrified seeing the dragon over there. They run back toward the cave. Hasumi Rijui asks them to wait. The dragon growls. The people who return to where they come from discover that the way has been cut off. They looked back at the dragon and asked each other what they would do now. One of them directs towards a direction opposite to the dragon and says that the only way to survive is to escape from there. One of them says if it is so, then how will they even reach over there? The first one replies that they have to move the dragon. Then he asks everyone to attack the dragon with magic. They use their magical powers to divert the attention of the dragon. They raise their hands, aim at the dragon, and attack him with magic. All their efforts to kill the dragon go in vain. The dragon stands still. The dragon's eyes blaze with fire, and he opens his mouth. One of the men says this is bad. Hasumi Rijui asks one of the members what is happening. He tells him that the dragon is preparing a magical roar, so they should run away quickly. He tells everyone to pull back and run away from the dragon. The members say even if they try to run away from the dragon where they are supposed to go. The dragon opens its mouth, prepares a magical roar, and emits a big ball of fire. The people get badly stricken by the ball of fire. The fire makes a big dig in the ground. One of the men says that he knows they will not have any chance to stand against the dragon. He adds that all of them are going to die. On the contrary, Hasumi Rijui is amazed by the dragon's power and calls it a fantastic display of destructive power. He checks out the exterior of the dragon and thinks that the exterior of the dragon is quite strong. He feels the exterior of the dragon is like a tank. Then he believes that a tank is always weak from the top. He imagines a tank in place of the dragon. He ignores the thought of conceiving a tank in place of the dragon and says that this is not the case with this thing. He again focuses his attention on the dragon. Hasumi Rijui notices some scratches on the dragon's abdomen. He wonders if a pebble scratches the dragon's abdomen. He thinks to test it as he stands still and plans to do so. One of his companions asks him what he is planning to do. He looks back, smiles, and tells him he wants to try something. He hides behind the builder and observes the other men fighting against the dragon. He notices the movements of the dragon. Then he comes out, takes aim, and throws his knife toward the dragon. The knife marks a cut on the abdomen of the dragon. The dragon growls wildly. One of the men shouts at Hasumi Rijui that he cannot defeat a dragon through a knife. Hasumi Rijui ignores the man. He focuses on the cut made by the knife and thinks it seems that the magical attacks are insignificant. He realizes that the only way to defeat the dragon is to try through physical attacks. Hasumi Rijui tells the other members that he can defeat the dragon if they cooperate with him. One of them asks him what did he say. The other one passes a comment that he cannot do that. Another man says that it seems the fear has made him insane. The member who was earlier in favor of Hasumi Rijui says she agrees with the other members this time. She adds he knows Hasumi Rijui is strong, but it is impossible to kill the dragon alone. Hasumi Rijui tells them he is not telling them to have faith in him. However, if things go on like this, they will not be able to survive. The girl asks him what they should do then. Another girl comes forward, calls her leader, and asks if she is in the right state of mind. The leader girl gives that girl a shut-up call. She says it is a swim or sink situation, so they should get a hold of themselves. All of them reluctantly agree to the decision and stand by Hasumi Rijui. Hasumi Rijui looks back, smiles, and tells them not to worry. 
he says the odds of the game are pretty good. He instructs others to divert the attention of the dragon somehow. One of them throws frequent fireballs at the dragon to divert his attention. While attacking the dragon, they feel the absence of Hasumi Rijui. They ask each other where Hasumi Rijui has gone. One says that he has used them as bait to take advantage of the opportunity to escape. They get mad at Hasumi Rijui and ask how he could do this to them. On the other hand, Hasumi Rijui observes he can reach the weak part of the dragon. He thinks it is the right time to use his trump card. He puts his hand in his pocket to take the coin and asks the leader girl how he can use it. She tells him to use his strength to crush the coin and keep the weapon he wants to summon in his mind. He puts the coin in his palm and closes his fist tightly. He crushes the coin and throws its pieces on the ground. A dim blue light emits out of it. Then, a sharp yellow light comes out of the coin and a weapon appears. Hasumi Rijui takes the weapon in his hand and aims at the dragon. He thinks 12.7 mm anti-material rifles are undoubtedly the right choice to deal with something like a dragon. An anti-material gun is something that is designed to be used against military equipment, structures and other hardware. An anti-material rifle is generally chambered in a larger chamber than the general rifle. Hasumi Rijui thinks he is lucky that he has used this rifle during sniper training. He believes that he can settle the dragon with only one shoot. He puts his finger on the trigger, aims at the dragon and shoots. The fire hits the dragon in the abdomen. Everyone gets shocked at this. The dragon loses his balance and seems that he will soon fall backward. The members seem unable to believe that someone has defeated the dragon. All of the members stand around the dead dragon. Soon, a pile of golden coins appears as a reward to kill the dragon. They take the gold coins in their hands. One says, this is the first time she has seen so many dropped items together. Simultaneously, their status windows appear and show that they all have leveled up. Hasumi Rijui hears the heavenly voice again and says it is as noisy as ever. He notices something is lying on the ground. He comes forward and takes it. He wonders to see a child's shoe over there. He thinks, what is a child's shoe doing here? The leader girl says to Hasumi Rijui that he is something else. They say it is difficult to believe that he has managed to defeat a dragon. They laugh and say he should join their team better next time. Hasumi Rijui shows the shoe to the leader and asks her to whom this shoe belongs. Then he adds that judging from the size, it seems a child's shoe. The leader girl says it seems it belongs to one of the children they are looking for. Hasumi Rijui asks her to tell him the whole scenario in detail from the beginning. She tells him that they gathered to take on a quest to search for the children who went missing. She tells him further how, in the middle of their search, they were attacked by numerous goblins and one of their companions got abducted. She says the children are most probably also taken away by the goblins. Hasumi Rijui confirms that they left to search for the lost children and the abducted companion. She says no. They decide to retreat and are in the middle of the way to escape the dungeon. Hasumi Rijui asks her why they abandoned the quest and forsake their comrade to run away. One of them says it is not a jock to continue their quest as they are not strong like him. The leader says to the others that they should not be quilling over this matter. She says they should think that the dungeon is brimming with dangerous monsters, which means it is not supposed to be a D-rank dungeon. One of them says it seems that the Adventurer Guild examination for assigning the rank was probably done carelessly. The leader says she can bet the case of goblins is also their mistake. The leader tells him that, individually, the goblins are low in number, but they are extremely dangerous in large groups. She tells him further that the goblins are luring them by taking their comrade as a hostage. She says it seems that their den is near. She adds they must refrain from fighting with them with their current skills and means. Hasumi Rijui says they should try. The leader stops him and says she wants to make two things clear to him. One of them adds the moment a dungeon rank is found to be mistakenly assigned, the associated request is rendered invalid, and it does not count as abandoning a quest. The leader says they are just recommending the quest to the adventurer with the high rank. The leader says they are just a group pieced together from the adventurers who want to continue the quest. So, they are comrades in the first place. She says adventurers are neither heroes nor men of valor. She adds they protect their bodies for themselves and look after their well-being. Hasumi Rijui says he got her point. The leader says it is good. Hasumi Rijui starts walking. The leader asks him where he is going. He replies that he is going to the den of so-called goblins. He asks her about the right way to go to their den. The leader holds his shoulder and asks him if he has not heard what she told him. 
He replies he heard that. The leader asks why he is going there. She adds one should avoid being reckless. He says to her that the decision they made needs to be corrected. All of them try to stop him. Hasumi Rijui says the reason that the goblin den is near is enough for him to turn back. Two members sit near the pile of golden coins. Hasumi Rijui asks them if there is a weapon summoning item in the pile of coins. One of them replies that there are only pieces of treasure and precious stones. He says, all right then. One of them calls him and asks him to wait. She says it is unbelievable that the guy is going alone to the den of the goblins to fight with their swarm. They see him going towards the cave. He reaches the entrance of the den and thinks the goblins are close. The scene shifts inside the cave, where the children and the abducted girl are tied to a tower. The terrified children cry badly. The girl tries to calm down the children and tells them not to cry. She says they should not give up, the help will reach them soon. Down there, where they are tied to the tower, there is a swarm of goblins. Hasumi Rijui enters the den of the goblins and cuts a goblin into two pieces with the help of his knife. The goblin falls with a splash of blood. The girl witnesses this scene. Hasumi Rijui holds his knife in a heroic style and tells the goblins to come forward if they want to die. A large swarm of the goblins runs toward him to attack. Hasumi Rijui also runs toward him with his knife. He cuts many goblins into pieces and keeps slaughtering them. Then he moves toward the children and the girl to free them. He throws his knife to cut their ropes. He succeeds in doing so. The children and the girl get free from the ropes. He makes eye contact with the girl and asks her if she is hurt. The girl asks who he is with tears in her eyes. Hasumi Rijui says that he heard about her situation from her comrades. The girl asks him if her comrades are fine. Hasumi Rijui says they will talk about it later. He adds they have to get out of that place first. The girl calms down the scared children. Hasumi Rijui says it is so bothersome that there are so many goblins. The girl says she would have fought along with him if she had her sword. Hasumi Rijui asks where her sword is. She replies she does not know where it is. She tells him that the goblins take her sword. Hasumi Rijui says she cannot help him if she does not have her sword right now. He says they do not have any other option but to use the means they have at that moment. Meanwhile, goblins attack them. Hasumi Rijui tells the girl to protect the children. He takes out his knife and fights alone with the goblins. He says there is no end to them to see so many of the goblins. He throws his knife and says the knife has become useless after getting stained by the blood of the goblins. A big goblin arrives, sees the scenario, and asks if he left them for too long. Hasumi Rijui jumps at him from a height. The girl covers the eyes of the children. The goblins see Hasumi Rijui attacking and roar. Hasumi Rijui attacks the goblin with his punch, but his hand slips because of the blood and the fat. The goblin attacks him with the help of an axe. Hasumi Rijui gets aggressive, makes another punch, and breaks the goblin's teeth. The girl asks him if he is all right. Hasumi Rijui holds his arm and replies that his strong arm is fine. He says he can continue his fight. Then he adds he means he will distract the enemies and she should take the children out of the place during that. The girl asks what he is planning to do. He tells her not to worry and says that he will buy her some time to escape the place. The girl says she will stay and fight by his side. Hasumi Rijui denies her suggestions and tells her to prioritize the safety of the civilians. The girl agrees with him. Hasumi Rijui thinks it will be quite hard to fight with the goblins. He thinks what makes the situation difficult is that the goblins are large in number and quick. He gathers his courage and says it will take a lot of stamina to kill all of them. He challenges the goblins and says let's see what lasts longer, their number or his stamina. Meanwhile, he hears someone talking about using magic. The other people also enter the den and use their magical powers to defeat the goblins. The leader instructs them to cover their bodies with the magical powers. The girl becomes happy to see her comrades. However, Hasumi Rijui wonders and asks them why all of them are here. The leader replies that their conscience is uneasy, so they think about not leaving them alone among the goblins. Hasumi Rijui smiles to hear the answer from the leader. He asks the girl about which magic the goblins are talking. She tells him the goblins clad themselves in the magic and enhance their physical strength. She says he has heard that even the adventurers who cannot use magic can do it too. He says that is how they move, so agility. He thinks for himself this sort of thing is entirely possible. The heavenly voice comes and asks him to check his status window. 
It tells him that the MP on his status window stands for magical power, and the number of MPS shows the amount of magic that he can use. Hasumi Rijui understands it and says it is how it works. The goblins stay persistent in fighting. Hasumi Rijui uses his magical power and starts knocking them down. The girl cheers and says the boy is amazing. She says he is quick to learn as he gets to know how to use magic in an instant. Meanwhile, the goblin king appears in the place. All of them get scared to see the king of the goblins. One of them tells others to run away as they cannot compete with the king of the goblins. Hasumi Rijui asks them to stay and tells them that it is not a problem to deal with him. The gigantic goblin attacks Hasumi Rijui. Hasumi Rijui attacks him back and punches him in the abdomen. The king of the goblins roars and falls to the ground. Everyone looks shocked to see this. The goblins start to run away to see their king dead. Hasumi Rijui makes a heroic pose with a sword. All the goblins run away. Then he asks the girl if the sword belongs to her. She tells him yes, this is her sword and thanks him. The children run toward him, call him big brother, and say he is amazing. The children tell him that they managed to bear all the things because the big sister told them that help would come soon. He pats their head and says they have done a good job. The girl thinks that the boy has done a great job by killing the king of the goblins without any weapon. She starts thinking, who is this boy? The dead bodies of the goblins start to dissolve into the air and precious dropped items appear. Everyone seems happy to see this. One of the girls holds Hasumi Rijui's arm and tries to heal his wound. The girl with the sword looks at Hasumi Rijui. The leader asks everyone to head back. Everyone cheers to hear that. The scene shifts to a green plain. Soon, they reach the village. The children happily enter the village door. The parents of the children hug them with tears in their eyes. Parents thank the leader for saving the lives of their children. The leader tells them that it was Hasumi Rijui who saved their kids. The kids say goodbye to him with tears in their eyes. Hasumi Rijui and the leader stand by the sacks of the jewels and gold coins. The leader asks him if it is okay with him that they are taking a big share of the dropped items. He says he would not been able to get out of the dungeon without their help. The leader replies they would not have survived if they had not helped them. She offers him a bag of jewels and says he should take it because money is not a burden. Hasumi Rijui holds the bag and says he will accept this gladly. He says goodbye to the civilians and sets off. He asks the sword girl if there is a place where he can exchange the items for money. The girl tells him that he has to go to the Adventure Guild for this exchange. She tells him that the closest Adventure Guild is located in the dungeon city of Ridam, which is across the mountains. Hasumi Rijui says thanks to her and tries to leave for that city. The girl stops him and asks him if he is planning to reach that place by foot. She says it is so reckless to think that. He holds his chin, makes a thinking gesture, and says he has no other option because he does not have money with him. The girl asks if the reason is money. Then she can pay, and they can hire a cartridge to reach there. Hasumi Rijui asks the girl if she has no obligation to go this far for him. She says it is her way of saying thanks to him. She requests him to let her do this for him. Hasumi Rijui agrees with her. The girl thinks Hasumi Rijui is a strange person. She says he is not just strong, but he is also a bit off. She says it seems as if he is from another world. They take a cartridge and reach an inn. The girl asks the man sitting at the reception to give them two rooms. The receptionist replies there is only one room available. She says they will take that room. Hasumi Rijui murmurs if it is okay for her to stay in the same room. The girl asks him what he is saying. Hasumi Rijui says nothing. He thinks it is normal for adventurers to stay in the same room like this. The man at the reception asks the girl if they are traveling as a married couple. The girl looks at Hasumi Rijui uncomfortably. Hasumi Rijui stays quiet. The girl gets mad at the man and says he is mistaken. They are not in a relationship. She says to the man that they will take two rooms. Hasumi Rijui says to the girl that they should go to the Radam city tomorrow. The girl says good night to him. He hears something while lying on the bed. He says the heavenly voice is back again. The heavenly voice replies yes it is back. The heavenly voice says there must be many things that he wants to ask him, but unfortunately he cannot tell him about a few things. Hasumi Rijui says there is only one thing that he wants to know right now. The heavenly voice asks what is this thing? He asks the heavenly voice if he can go back to his world. The voice says it is possible. The voice also tells him that three places in this world can take him back. 
The voice adds that he can only get there if he conquers a mythic rank dungeon. When he hears about the mythic rank dungeon, he remembers the words of the leader who told him about that. He then takes a side and goes to sleep. The voice says that is all he wants to ask. The voice says that he could have more questions if he had not answered him. He tells the heavenly voice to be quiet as he is trying to sleep. The next day, Hasumi Rijui, along with a girl, sets off for the city of Radon. The girl tells him that the city is now in sight. He sees the city from a distance. The city is located around a dungeon. They enter the city and reach the marketplace, where there are different shops. Hasumi Rijui asks so, this is the dungeon city of Radon. The girl tells him that a legendary rank dungeon lies at the bottom of a large hole. The girl says that the city was built by the adventurers who had gathered here to conquer the dungeon. The city flourished because of a dungeon. He thinks it is certainly bustling with people. As they move into the market, the girl tells him that people of different races live in the city. Hasumi Rijui scratches his chin and thinks about what name he should call the girl. The girl feels his hesitation, turns back, and says did she not tell him her name? She says he can call her Faria. He wonders why she does not reveal her family name. On the contrary, Faria thinks she is unaware of some odd circumstances. Hasumi Rijui calls Faria and asks if they are going to the Adventurer Guild. Faria says yes, they are going to the Adventurer Guild. Hasumi Rijui asks her about the Adventurer Guild. She says, as the name directly implies, it is an organization that supports the adventurers. She further tells him that the contents that the operation carries are varied. She adds from the quest referral, certification of the adventurer ranks, and certification of the dungeon ranks to the weapons lending for the adventurer and purchasing and selling drop items, the organization works for so many things. She also tells him that the cohesion of the organization that is spared across all the nations in the continent is formidable. She adds the power of the organization goes beyond the country. Hasumi Rijui looks at the bag of dropped items and says he got her point. She says they will sell the items once they go inside. She buys some refreshments and hands over to him. She tells him to sell or buy the items first, and he needs to register himself as an adventurer. He eats and thinks that he needs to explore the dungeons if he wants to go back to his world. He thinks these things are kind of qualifications that he needs to do that. He says it would be good to have them. Faria says there is no doubt that he is an a rank adventurer. Hasumi Rijui asks her what her rank is. She tells him that she is still at rank C adventurer. They soon reach a place. Faria tells him this is the place. The place is like that of an inn. So many people sit at the tables having their drinks. Many of them are chatting with each other. Some of them are checking the notice board. Faria takes Hasumi Rijui to the reception. She says to the receptionist that Hasumi Rijui wants to get registered as an adventurer. The receptionist asks him if he can write. Hasumi Rijui thinks he can somehow manage to speak their language, but he cannot write it. He replies no. The girl replies that they will proceed orally and she will take the written notes. She takes her pen and asks him what type of magic he can use. He closes his fist tightly and says he cannot use magic. The receptionist says that registering someone as an adventurer who cannot use magic is difficult. Faria stops her and asks her to wait for a second. Faria tells her that despite being unable to use magic, this person is strong and he has killed a goblin king and a dragon. Everyone looks at them to hear this. Farah further tells her that he has killed both of them unarmed. Everyone laughs at him. One of the people says that he is a young, rich master who does not know the rules of this world. Another one says he is not quite young and adds he looks like a swindler. Faria shouts at the people and says how dare they be rude to Hasumi Rijui. Hasumi Rijui stops her. One of the people tells her that he has deceived her. They say that a boy cannot kill a king, goblin, or dragon. A man says to Faria that she should join their party instead of sticking to Hasumi Rijui. The man holds Faria's arm and says it would be more fun if she joined their party. Hasumi Rijui takes the hand of that man and frees Faria from his grip. He takes Faria behind him. The man abuses him and asks him not to interfere. Hasumi Rijui says can he not notice that someone dislikes his presence. The man gets mad and says as if trash like him that is unable to use magic is in a position of self-importance and sermon others. Hasumi Rijui says the man does not know that he is about to be sliced. The man provokes others and says they should punish that bastard who got the wrong idea. Hasumi Rijui takes the position to beat the man. The receptionist tells everyone to calm down. Meanwhile, a man steps down from the stairs and asks what they are doing. 
The red-haired man, dressed in a uniform, asks, where are the ones who are making a fuss in his guild? He looks at Hasumi Rijui as everyone raises their fingers towards him. The red-haired comes towards Hasumi Rijui and says he has not seen him before. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria who this man is. Faria says he must be the guild master in charge. He asks everyone what happened here. One of the men says that they are just messing around. The guild master says it does not look like that though. One of the men says that he is acting high and mighty. The guild master punches him in the face and says it is his guild, so they should not think that they can go around and create a mess in his guild. The guild master asks Hasumi Rijui if he wants to say something. Then he asks the receptionist if she wants to say anything. She tells the guild master that they have just come here to register as adventurers. The guild master laughs and says oh so they come here for registration. Hasumi Rijui says yes. Then he says that he has changed his mind after seeing him. Faria stops him. The guild master asks Hasumi Rijui to wait and says he should be frustrated. Then the guild master says that he will personally check him. The scene shifts to the training ground behind the adventurer guild. The man says he is sorry about the boy's fate as the hobby of the guild master is to drive away the rookie adventurers. The man says that on multiple occasions, the folks have been beaten to the pulp by the guild master and their hopes have been crushed. The boy says still there is no need to worry about it. Faria feels hopeful and says Hasumi Rijui will win the fight. The man wonders from where this confidence is coming. The guild master says to Hasumi Rijui that they can begin at any time. Hasumi Rijui thinks it would be best for him to ask for hand-for-hand -hand combat. Then he thinks that his opponent can use magic. He thinks he should get a feel for what his opponent can do. Both of them make moves to start the fight. The guild master uses his full magical power to beat him. But Hasumi Rijui jumps up and holds the attack of the guild master. The guild master says that he has done well to evade his attack and smiles. Hasumi Rijui focuses and tries to comprehend what sort of power the guild master has just used. Faria says he has used fire and earth. She says that the guild master is a double element user. The status window of the guild master appears and shows that his name is Rasio, and he has expertise in fire and earth elements. In addition, the status window shows that his level is 58. Rasio again manipulates his powers. His hair heroically flies in the air, he holds pieces of rocks in one hand and a ball of fire in the other hand. The adventurers are the individuals born with the power of magic inside them. The magic itself is not associated with any element. However, when the adventurers manifest magic, it is brought forth in the four basic elements, wind, fire, earth, and water. Many humans are only able to use fire magic. The individuals that can use double elements are quite rare to exist. The elf says what a drag. However, the boy who cheers Hasumi Rijui says he will go down soon. Rossio laughs and asks Hasumi Rijui what happened to him. He says he cannot just run around to evade. If he does so, then it is not a test at all. Meanwhile, he keeps attacking him with fire and rocks. Hasumi Rijui says he is right. He cannot win by doing so. He thinks that although the attacks of the guild master are flashy, they are also monotone. Hasumi Rijui thinks if he clad his magical powers and increased his speed, then it would be a piece of cake for him to win against Rasio. He goes close to Rasio. Rasio again attacks him. Hasumi Rijui jumps in the air to block the attack. He swiftly returns to the ground. That is the moment when he gets the chance. He raises his hand and beats Rossian with a heavy punch. He soon makes Rossio taste the dust of the ground. The spectators say it is incredible that the boy defeated the guild master. Faria says she told them that he is a strong person. He calls the guild master Mr. Examiner and asks him what the result of his assessment is. The guild master feels insulted. He says if he cannot use magic, he will not let him register as an adventurer. The spectators get mad at his decision. They tell the guild master to stop messing around. The guild master gives them a shut up call and says he can do anything in this guild as he is the law in this guild. He threatens the spectators that he will revoke their qualifications if they try to oppose him. The spectators look at him in anger. Meanwhile, the receptionist reaches the training ground and tells the guild master that something serious has occurred. The guild master complains that the girl is so noisy and asks what has happened. The girl tells him that a troll has got free from the dungeon and is rampaging through the city. The lives of the civilians are in danger. The guild master becomes worried to hear this and asks the girl again to confirm. 
The troll soon causes chaos in the city. The clouds of smoke can be seen everywhere. The people run here and there to save their lives. The troll possesses superhuman strength, a high rank, and a regeneration capacity. He badly destroys the city as he moves around. He growls wildly and adds to the fear of the people. He caused huge property loss. In addition, people feel just like tiny creatures before them, and their efforts to save their lives seem to be in vain. The adventurers use their magical powers to stop him but in vain. Big clouds of fire and smoke cover the atmosphere. One of the adventurers asks the others if they succeeded in stopping the troll. Meanwhile, the troll growls and holds that adventurer in his hand to crush him. It seems quite an uphill task to deal with that gigantic creature. One of the adventurers says that dealing with the troll is an impossible task. The other one says if things go on like this, the whole city will be destroyed soon. On the other hand, the guild master shouts that he has never heard before that a troll can get free from the dungeon. Everyone looks worried. The guild master says that there seem to be precedents for this kind of calamity caused by dungeon growth. The guild master holds his head and asks why all of this is happening in his city. One of the adventurers says the more important thing to do at this moment is to think about what they should do. He asks if they should form a subjugation party. He adds that they are planning to evacuate the city. Theria notices Hasumi Rijui is going somewhere. She asks him where he is going. He looks back and says of course he is going to the site to look at the so-called troll. Faria asks him to wait and says she will also go with him. The other adventurers also run after them to accompany them. The crew of the adventurer guild stands shocked. Hasumi Rijui asks what kind of monster a troll is. Faria tells him that he is a humanoid monster with a body larger than an orc. She also tells him that a troll is a monster who is physically strong but dim-witted. She adds the trolls cannot use magic. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria what is the most troublesome thing about a troll. Meanwhile, they reach the site. They see adventurers fighting to stop the troll. An adventurer uses his magic and cuts the arm of the troll. The arm of the troll falls to the ground. However, he instantly regenerates his arm. Hasumi Rijui observes that and realizes the most troublesome thing about the trolls is that they can quickly regenerate. Hasumi Rijui and Faria take refuge behind a wall. Faria tells Hasumi Rijui that their regeneration makes it difficult to deal with them. She tells him that as long as his head cannot be destroyed, he will continue to regenerate himself. She tells him that inside a dungeon, it is easy to trap them and then attack them from a height to subjugate them. But in the city, there are no buildings taller than the troll. Hasumi Rijui looks into the positive side and thinks that the troll is not covered with magic. He says he can deal damage with a normal attack. He says he has five weapon summoning coins in the store. Everyone gets refuge behind one thing or the other. Hasumi Rijui says he is going to kill that thing. He asks others to give him a hand. Everyone gets shocked to hear him. Faria calls everyone aside and tells them to evacuate the city. Some of the adventurers try to divert the attention of the troll and lure him towards a direction. The troll gets mad and runs after them. They plan to take him to the training ground. Hasumi Rijui reaches the training ground before the troll. Soon, the troll also reaches the training ground. The adventurers say that they have lured him there as per the plan. Hasumi Rijui says they have done a great job by taking him there. He tells them to leave the rest to him. He uses mirror reflection to blur the vision of the troll. Then he places a burning rock in the feet of the troll to cause an explosion and make him lose his balance. The troll falls to the ground and growls. To hear the noise, one of the adventurers asks the fellow what has happened. The fellow adventurer replies that Hasumi Rijui provoked the troll with a mirror and then caused an explosion. One of them asks how he managed to create an explosion. They say, what was that if it was not magic? Hasumi Rijui knocks the troll down. Hasumi Rijui reflects and remembers how he used a bomb to create a trap for the monster. Faria tells Hasumi Rijui that the troll is trying to get up again. Hasumi Rijui thinks as if he is going to let him do that. He quickly uses another coin to get another bomb. He places that bomb in the mouth of the troll without wasting any time. Then he takes out his last coin. He crushes the coin and throws its pieces in the air to summon another weapon. This time he summons a 5.56mm NATO caliber ot Phi minimum light machine gun. He takes the gun, aims at the troll, jumps in the air, and shoots the monster in the head. At the same moment, his status window appears and shows that he has leveled up. 
Ferio rushes to the training ground and asks Hasumi Rijui if he is injured. He replies he is fine. Other adventurers also come to the training ground and say that he is an amazing fighter. They ask if he cannot use the magic, then what he just used to kill the troll. The one who earlier messed up with him in the guild asks him to join his party. Feria thinks that those adventurers were against Hasumi Rijui, and now they are entranced by him and changed their minds. She says to herself that she is right to think that he is not an ordinary person. Fere thinks about the weapons that he has used to kill the troll. She wonders why she has never seen these weapons before. She again thinks about Hasumi Rijui's identity. The adventurers ask the guild master to stop being unreasonable. They ask him to register Hasumi Rijui as an adventurer. They say he single-handedly defeated the troll. One of the adventurers says that he should be acknowledged as an A-rank adventurer. The guild master resists and says he has witnessed the whole scenario. He gives the adventurer a shut-up call. He says what about the weird weapons that he has used to kill the troll? He says he would not acknowledge the use of those weapons. He says this is his guild and he will not give the qualification of an adventurer to a person who cannot use magic. The crowd of adventurers curses the guild master. They say that he should stop being stupid. The guild master tells them to shut their mouths. He says if they do not stop doing that, he will strip them of their qualifications as adventurers. Meanwhile, another official comes and says he wonders if things are going far. Hasumi Rijui asks about the person. A girl tells him that he is the count who governs the area. The count addresses Rossio and says that he does not remember that he gave him authority to make such decisions. Rossio says the management of the guild is his responsibility. The Count says he has entrusted him with this responsibility with the belief that he will manage the guild with justice. The Count says what he wants him to do. Should he inform the guild headquarters about his misconduct? The guild master bows down and apologizes to the Count for his actions. The Count then addresses Hasumi Rijui and says he is sorry for the rudeness. He says that as the ruling lord of the city, he is thankful to Hasumi Rijui for what he has done for the city. The Count calls Hasumi Rijui a savior who saved the whole city from the troll. He says he bears all the responsibility for his registration as an adventurer and allows the procedure to proceed. Hasumi Rijui says he would like to correct his being a savior of the city. He tells the Count that he has managed to kill the troll with the cooperation of the other adventurers. Everyone becomes happy to hear this. The Count praises the modesty of the young man. He says most adventurers put emphasis on their achievements and merits, but he is different. The Count says no wonder why Faria is charmed by him. Faria asks the Count to stop saying that. The other adventurers wonder if Faria knows the Count in person. The Count tells everyone that Faria is his daughter. Faria, Hasumi Rijui, and the Count leave the place in a cartridge. The Count tells Hasumi Rijui that a few days back, he received a letter from his daughter. He adds that his name was mentioned in the letter. Hasumi Rijui focuses on the words, a few days ago. Then he thinks it must be when they stay in the inn. The Count says that mostly her letters are reminiscent of the clerical reports, but this time she wrote a long letter. He says he was surprised by that sort of letter. Faria stops her father to talk about the letter. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui thinks about Faria's status window and remembers the details that she is a level 20 adventurer with the skill of swordsmanship and expertise in the element of fire. He thinks it was not mentioned on her status window that she is a noble. Faria thinks that being the daughter of a noble does not count as a job. She makes a puppy face and asks her father to stop. Her father says stop making pout like that. Meanwhile, the status window of the count appears and shows him as a feudal lord with expertise in swordsmanship. He thinks his status window shows his job, but Faria's status window does not show her job. He wonders what criteria have been used. Johan Mirabel asks Hasumi Rijui if it is okay for him to leave behind the troll's dropped items and arrive here quickly. On the other hand, the other adventurers feel happy to get the troll's dropped items. Johan Mirabel says he can send someone to retrieve those items. Hasumi Rijui says no to Johan Mirabel. He says he wants to travel as light as he can. The cartridge knocks and tells them they will soon reach their destination. Johan Mirabel welcomes Hasumi Rijui to his state. The cartridge stops in front of a beautiful and grand palace. They enter the palace. A member of housekeeping brings water and a towel to Hasumi Rijui. Hasumi Rijui cleans himself and wears his uniform again. The housekeeping assists him in going to the desired place. Hasumi Rijui checks out the house of the Count. 
Hasumi Rijui thinks he does not know how much power a feudal lord, a count who is known as a noble in this world. He says the wealth of the count appears to be a real deal. Soon, a lady apologizes to Hasumi Rijui for keeping him waiting. Hasumi Rijui sees Faria in a beautiful gown. Soon, the status window rang and showed her status as the daughter of the lord. Hasumi Rijui realizes the status changes as the situation changes. He thinks if it works like this, then the assassins and spies can take action easily. Faria finds Hasumi Rijui thinking something and asks if she is looking weird in that dress. He says no, it is not like that. The dress suits her. Faria feels shy to hear this. Johan Mirabel notices his daughter's reaction. They all sit on the dining table. Johan Mirabel asks Hasumi Rijui to let him reiterate. Then he says that it is not right to ask his daughter's savior, but he wants to know who he is. Faria tries to stop her father. However, Johan Mirabel ignores his daughter. He continues to ask and says he is capable of dealing with a goblin king, a dragon, and a troll single-handedly. So he cannot be an ordinary person. Faria tells her father that it is rude to ask such questions. Hasumi Rijui says he does not mind such things. He says he knows that sooner or later he has to talk to someone about these things. He realizes that he wants allies in this world. He tells the Count that he is not a native of this world. Both Faria and her father are shocked to hear this. Faria says this is unbelievable. Johan Mirabel says there must be some gods who hold the power to do that. He says this is the first time he heard something like his case. The Count asks, then eventually, he wants to return to his world. Hasumi Rijui says yes, he wants to return to his original world. He says it seems he has to conquer the mythical rank dungeons to do that. Faria says if he has to conquer all of them. She adds this is quite unreasonable. She says it is said that only one person every hundred years can conquer that. Hasumi Rijui says the mission is difficult, but it is not a reason for him not to try to complete it. He says his comrades are waiting for him. The Count says he wonders if this is also part of the divine providence. Hasumi Rijui asks what he means by this. The Count tells him that the seals block the mythical rank dungeons. He says an item known as a divine gate key is required to open any of them. He says there are divine gate keys that correspond with each of the dungeons. He tells him that he can get those keys in the legendary rank dungeon. Johann Mirabel adds the closest mythical rank dungeon is the one that is located at the royal capital, the Dragon God Dungeon. He says its divine gates key is said to lie in the city of Redom legendary rank dungeon. He says one needs permission from the Lord to explore its depths. Hasumi Rijui asks Johann Mirabel if he can have his permission to do that. Johann Mirabel says he permits him as a token of thanks for saving the life of his daughter. Then he says it would be dishonest of him to express it like that. Johann Mirabel says he frankly wants to ask him something. He says to Hasumi Rijui to conquer the legendary rank dungeon and save his territory. Hasumi Rijui asks him what the matter is. Johann Mirabel says the dungeon core is running amok. Farai is shocked and says it cannot be that. Hasumi Rijui asks what is a dungeon core? Faria says that it is a manifestation of divine power that is related to the administration of the dungeon. She says they call it a core. She says the core lies in the deepest part of the dungeon, constantly releasing power. She says the power causes the dungeon to grow. She says mostly the adventurers stunt the dungeon's growth by exterminating the monsters inside it, which in turn reprives the core of its power. She says on some occasions, the core goes haywire and the dungeon starts to grow non-stop. Hasumi Rijui asks. So, are they saying the dungeon of the Redom City is going haywire right now? Johan Morable says if things continue to go on like this, the monsters will start to come out of the dungeon. He says that in that case, the city will be attacked by the miners flooding out of the dungeon. He says the dungeon will itself engulf this firedom. He says he wants him to destroy the dungeon core and stop it from happening. He says he is well aware of the fact that he is making an unreasonable request. He asks Hasumi Rijui if it is okay with him. Faria tells him that the danger level of the legendary rank dungeon is different from the S rank dungeon. Hasumi Rijui says he needs the divine key that is in the dungeon. He says he can do what is necessary to be done. Faria says she will accompany him as his guide. Johan Mirabel tries to stop his daughter. She says there is no use in stopping her as she is charmed by Hasumi Rijui and wants to accompany him on this mission. Johan Mirabel grants her permission for the mission. Then he offers them his cartridge and requests them to accept it, 
the cartridge drops them to the required place and leaves. Faria tells Hasumi Rijui the direction of the dungeon's entrance and asks if they should go on the way. He says yes. He notices that Faria's job has again changed to adventurer. He says he is right to think that it changes according to the situation. He asks her why she is an adventurer despite being the daughter of a noble. She says this is because she wants to become a knight like her father. She tells him that her father was a knight who served under the current monarch. She also tells Hasumi Rijui that her father saved the Naxus kingdom from the war. She says the threats of war have passed, but the citizens are exposed to the dangers of the dungeons. She says she wishes to save them from these threats at least. Hasumi Riju remembers how she risked her life for the children in the den of the goblins. He brings his hand toward her and says he wants to ascertain their powers before entering the dungeon. He asks her if she can show him what sort of magic she can do. She says oh, she has not used her magic in front of him yet. She thinks for a moment and agrees to show her magic to him. She goes a little far from him. She shows him her swordsmanship and fire magic by creating explosions. He says her magical powers are quite impressive. He adds her magical powers stand high among other adventurers. Faria thanks him for praising her powers. Hasumi Rijui says it takes her too much time to take action to attack. He says it is her weak point. He says this is the reason that she has just used her powers up. She says it is as he said. She tells him that since childhood she has been unable to use her magical powers without her sword. She says she is sorry only to be able to wield useless magic. She feels sad. Hasumi Rijui soothes her and tells her there is nothing to be sorry about. He says it is just that she possesses a power that is different from others. Hasumi Rijui tells her that she only needs to anticipate its use and come up with a good battle strategy following that prediction. Faria looks at him and calls his name. Hasumi Rijui asks her to let's go. Then he checks his status window and says he cannot say with surety if his level is good enough or not. He says he needs to get more weapon summoning coins while exploring the dungeon. They keep on going and reach the gate of the dungeon. Foria tells him that they can go to the deepest level of the dungeon by using a teleportation formation. She says though she knows that the teleportation formation will work successfully, she still feels fear in doing so. While she thinks about that, Hasumi Rijui jumps into the dungeon. She calls him and asks him to wait for her. They fall into the dungeon. They see two orcs walking in front of the gate. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria if they are also monsters. She says yes. He says they are already flooding out of the dungeon. Faria says an attack from the orcs of these numbers, and that strength would be dangerous. She says since the orcs are creatures of low intellect, there is a usual method of luring them one by one and killing them. She adds that right now they cannot use that method. She says it would be dangerous for them to be noticed by the orcs in addition. Hasumi Rijui says he has an idea in that case. He asks Faria to use her magic. Faria looks at the orcs and then thinks about her magic. The gloomy atmosphere of the dungeon is enlightened by a hole from where the light is coming out. The orcs seem like the guards who are looking after the door. Somehow, an orc gets a cut on his leg. He sits on the ground. The other orc notices that, meanwhile, that orc gets hit by a pebble. The orc looks around. Hasumi Rijui prepares another pebble to throw at the orc. He first observes the orcs from a height. Then he jumps in front of them. The orcs look back to hear the sound of someone jumping. They see Hasumi Rijui and run unthinkingly toward him to attack. The orcs are in great numbers. Hasumi Riju assesses their speed and comprehends that they are quick. He lures them toward a specific direction. They unthinkingly run after him. Hasumi Rijui says he has grown fairly familiar with using the magical powers. He thinks now he can perform movements that were not possible for him before. He says that in that case, he should use his magic against the orcs. He stops and throws a stone toward the orcs with the help of his magic. Hasumi Rijui says now he can use his magic to influence the objects around him. He says it seems there are various ways to use the magic. He looks back and sees a crowd of orcs coming toward him. He notices that the number of the orcs has multiplied. He says whatever the case may be, he has to defeat the orcs. He thinks he will soon reach a point upon which he agrees. He enters a semi-demolished building. After entering the building, he stops for a moment. He looks at the orcs coming towards him. The orcs growl at him. He calls Faria to come and attack the orcs. Faria comes forward along with her sword. She takes out her sword and attacks the orcs. She uses her magic of fire and starts killing the orcs. 
low-witted orcs are unable to understand the situation. Feria uses heavy fire attacks to kill the orcs and succeeds in doing so. Soon, the status window appears and shows that they have leveled up. Hasumi Rijui notices that his level increases even when he works with others. Hasumi Rijui says Feria's level would have increased also. Feria feels satisfied to see that she managed to kill so many monsters with one attack. She says she has never done this before. She feels happy. Feria bows before Hasumi Rijui and says thanks to him. He says not to sweat it. He says that means she already had it in her to begin with. He looks at the ground and notices that there are so many weapon summoning coins. He says with the help of these coins, it will be easy for him to conquer the dungeon. Hasumi Rijui picks another coin and notices that it is a power restoring coin. Feria tells him that the coin can restore all of his power. She adds that depleted magical power recovers gradually over a certain period through the absorption of magic power in the air. She says that with the help of this coin, he can do it instantly. Hasumi Rijui asks Feria how much time it takes to recover naturally. She says it takes almost one hour. He asks her about her current magical power. She says it is three out of a maximum of 120. Hasumi Rijui feels that his magical power has also gone down, but he feels that it is not as low as Feria's. He asks Feria to take the energy saving coin. He says if she takes it, then the count will be used more appropriately. Fari says she will take it then. She asks him if they should carry on their journey now. He says yes. They open the door and carry on their journey to the dungeon. They walk on a semi-demolished bridge. It seems like a strange space ahead of them. Hasumi Rijui says they are again in a never-ending space to cover. Feria notices that the walls are emitting a strange, dim light. Hasumi Rijui says it is prearranging to facilitate human exploration. Then he notices something and asks Feria to stop. He blocks her way and tries to protect her. Feria asks him if something is wrong. They see some people walking from a distance. The people have strange types of masks on their faces. Hasumi Rijui and Feria hide behind a wall. Hasumi Rijui asks Feria if they are also adventurers. Feria says this cannot be the case. Feria tells him that the kingdom forbids the exploration of the legendary rank dungeon. She says permission from her father is required to explore the dungeon. She says if her father had given authorization to someone, he must have told her about that. Hasumi Rijui says that means they are unauthorized explorers. He says in other words, they are a dungeon looting party. She agrees with him. She notices their swords and says the equipment of the people is of high quality. Hasumi Rijui says in the conversation that the guy he met earlier these people are carrying better equipment. They notice that there are some pro-combatants among them. Hasumi Rijui and Farai comprehend that these people are not ordinary thieves. Faria asks him what they should do now. She says she should hide from them. Hasumi Rijui says they should capture one of them and ask him directly. Faria gets frightened to hear his plan. The plan seems dangerous to her. The people keep going on their way. One of them feels something on his shoulder. He looks back and asks his fellow what it is. The fellow tells him to carry on walking and maintain the pace. The man thinks it must be his imagination. Soon, Hasumi Rijui puts a hand on his mouth and drags him backward. The man tries to free himself from the grip of Hasumi Rijui. The man asks him who the hell is he. Hasumi Rijui asks him to be silent. He puts a knife on his neck and says he is the one who will ask questions. He threatens the man and says if he does not answer his question, he knows what will happen to him. The man sweats badly. He asks the man who he is and why they are exploring the dungeon. Forrest says if he does not know that this is the legendary rank dungeon. She says he must be aware that the Count's permission is required to explore the dungeon. The man says they know that the Count's permission is required to explore the dungeon. He adds they do not care about it. The man tells them they are unregistered adventurers. Faria clarifies to Hasumi Rijui that they are the adventurers who are not affiliated with any adventurer guild office. She tells him that since the retainer fees are usually high sums, they prefer not to share any profit with the guild. She tells him that the unregistered adventurers also avoid paying intermediation fees. She says it is said that they also take illegal requests. She says they are dishonest and disgusting fellows. The man asks Faria why she is passing harsh comments. He says they are just against the monopoly of the guild. He says if they know who their client is this time, then they must stop complaining. Hasumi Rijui says that means their client is a big shot this time. The man laughs. 
He is almost about to tell them about their client when they hear someone complaining about the orcs. The fellows of the man get stuck between so many orcs. One fat member of the group complains about why so many orcs appear all of a sudden. He says nobody told them that this would happen to them. The man captured by Hasumi Rijui says this bad. He worries about his fellows and says the orcs from all sides surround them. He says he has to go to help his fellows. They see the people surrounded by the orcs from a height. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria to keep an eye on the man and jumps to help the people. He quickly takes out weapon summoning coins from his pocket. This time he summons a FAMAS 5.56mm NATO caliber bull pop assault rifle. He takes hold of the rifle and aims at the orcs. Soon he throws continuous shots at the orcs. The unregistered adventurers get shocked at his moves and ask each other what is going on. While firing at the orcs Hasumi Rijui tells them to get out of the way. They quickly run to escape the orcs. Hasumi Rijui takes them to a safe place. One of them says thanks to him for saving their lives. One of them asks Feria if they are there to do looting. She says no, they are not. She tells them her father, the Count, permits them to explore the dungeon. The man says that means she is the daughter of the Count. The unregistered adventurers look at each other. Feria asks Hasumi Rijui if she has done something wrong to reveal that. Hasumi Rijui no, this is the perfect time to reveal this. He says to the adventurers that there is no need to feel guilty about it. He asks them to join them in the mission of cleaning the dungeon. He says they already know who their client is. One of them says if he already knows about their client, then there is no need to hide from them. Feria is shocked to hear the words of Hasumi Rijui. Meanwhile, one of the unregistered adventurers says that he is right to guess that the one who hired them is the monarch of the kingdom himself. Hasumi Rijuan thinks he already knows that. The unregistered adventurer says that he does not know anything about this matter. Faria needs clarification to hear the conversation between Hasumi Rijui and the adventurer. She says Hasumi Rijui is amazing. Hasumi Rijui asks her what he means by the monarch of the kingdom. She says he means the king of the kingdom, the royal highness of the Nexus Kingdom, whom her father served as a knight. She tells him that the Nexus Kingdom is a kingdom among many small kingdoms that fill the continent. She tells him that it stands superior among other countries for possessing the mythic rank dungeon. She asks, but why would the Loyal Highness commission illegal looting? She tells him further that this dungeon is bestowed to her father by the Loyal Majesty himself. She says it is an act of betrayal. The unregistered adventurer says that they do not care about the circumstances of the client. They take requests for the sake of money. Faria gets mad at the adventurer. She takes out her sword and tries to attack the adventurer. However, Hasumi Rijui stops her from doing that. He asks her to wait for a moment. Hasumi Rijui offers them another opportunity. He says he will hire them. He says he wants them to cooperate with them to reach the deepest part of the dungeon. The unregistered adventurers think for a moment. They inquired Hasumi Rijui about the payment for this mission. Hasumi Rijui says the payment will be the same as paid by the king of the kingdom. He says that in addition to that, they will get all the dropped items. He further says he will take the weapon summoning coins and the divine key of the gate. The unregistered adventurers think for a moment and say they are ready to cooperate with him. Then, the unregistered adventurer shares his worry with Hasumi Rijui. He asks how they will explore the dungeon with so many orcs roaming around. He shakes hands with Hasumi Rijui as a sigh of joining hands to complete the mission. Faria feels uncomfortable about this decision. She asks Hasumi Rijui if it is okay to join hands with the looting party to explore the dungeon. Hasumi Rijui asks her to calm down. He says he does not know what the king is scheming. Hasumi Rijui says to Faria that in the current scenario, the best thing for them is to continue to achieve their original goal while interfering with the plan of the king. She says he is right to make this decision. Hasumi Rijui tells everyone to move on and continue their journey toward the deepest part of the dungeon. They start their journey again under the leadership of Hasumi Rijui. As they restart their journey, they see some more orcs roaming on a bridge. One of the unregistered adventurers gets annoyed by the orcs again. He asks why these orcs keep loitering around here. Hasumi Rijui asks the adventurer if there is any other route that they can take to reach their desired place. The adventurer replies no, there is no other route to reach that place. He says they would not be able to reach the deepest part of the dungeon if they did not pass through this way. Faria says she has also heard from her father that there is only one direct path available to reach the deepest part of the dungeon. The unregistered adventurer asks Hasumi Rijui what they are going to do. 
He says it is absurd to face so many orcs. Hasumi Rijui says that it will be fine as long as they do not face them directly. Both Faria and the adventurer need clarification to hear the words of Hasumi Rijui. One of the adventurers calls the orcs and asks them to look at him. One more adventurer joins him. One of them teases the orcs and asks them to come to them if they have courage. The orcs look mad at them. They look at them with anger. The orcs growl and run toward them. They keep making bad faces to tease the orcs. The fat adventurer calls his fellows and tells them that they have successfully lured the orcs to the required place. He asks his fellow to do something quickly. Faria says the scenario made her remember something. She says someone had done the same job when he killed the troll. Hasumi Rijui says that it is a trick to bring someone to a place where you can take advantage. He smiles and says it is a basic principle of the battlefield. The unregistered adventurer sees Hasumi Rijui in a calm position. He asks him if they are not going to take action. He replies they need to get a little more closer. The adventurers who were assigned the task of alluring the orcs ran mindlessly to save their lives from the orcs. Hasumi Rijui, who keeps a keen eye on the orcs, says now is the right time to attack as the orcs are close enough now. He commands the other adventurers to do the thing he told them to do earlier. They drag heavy blocks of rocks. The orcs stop for a while to see what is happening. As the orcs try to comprehend what is happening, two of the members of the group attack them with the balls of fire. They attack them from a height where they are standing. So many adventurers attack the orcs at the same time. Big balls of fire can be seen everywhere around the orcs. One of the adventurers shouts and instructs his fellows not to stop their attack. The ones who ran to lure the orcs stand still and observe the accomplishment of the plan and say this is amazing. One of the adventurers smiles and says that they have easily defeated a group of orcs. He says thanks to Hasumi Rijui for his help. He adds it is because of his help that they managed to complete their task without any difficulty. Then he addresses two of his fellows by calling them newcomers. Meanwhile, the newcomers jump from the height. He asks them what they are doing. Hasumi Rijui notices that the two of them are different from the rest of the group. The newcomer jumps down and sits beside a wall. The leader of the adventurer tells him that they are not originally their comrades. He tells him that they lack a workforce, so they hire some drifting adventurers. Hasumi Rijui says it seems they are spies sent by the king. The unregistered adventurer holds his head and asks Hasumi Rijui what he means by that. He says they are sent to keep tabs on them to see if they are working properly or not. He says they are there to have a look at the adventurers and to prevent them from running with the money and other items. The adventurer says they carry out their job diligently, whatever they are assigned to do. Faria asks if he is changing sides with Hasumi Rijui as he is arguing with him. She finds it offensive that the adventurer is arguing with his comrade for nothing. The adventurer says that it is okay with him. He tells them that they are heading toward the deepest part of the dungeon. Faria says they should chase them right away. The adventurer asks them how they are going to do that. Hasumi Rijui says they distracted the orcs while leaving, so the orcs are not coming after them now. The adventurer says he believes that the ten of the orcs are still there. Hasumi Rijui smiles and says that kind of number is fine for them to manage. He says to Faria that the orcs are up to her now. Faria smiles and says of course. Faria jumps onto the orcs and says they have done this before. Both Hasumi Rijui and Faria put their efforts into action against the orcs. Hasumi Rijui increases his speed with the help of the magic and reaches the orcs in no time. He takes out his knife and attacks the orcs swiftly. In addition, he uses his physical strength to fight against the orcs. He calls out Faria. Faria makes continuous attacks with the help of her magical power of fire element. Big flames of the fire cover the whole area. Both of them succeed in defeating the orcs. The adventurers are amazed to see Faria and Hasumi Rijui's combat skills. The adventurer asks Hasumi Rijui about his real identity. He smiles while looking at a weapon summoning coin. He says he is just a soldier. He says let's get going on the way. The adventurer says yes to his call. They step down the stairs into a semi-darm place, which is illuminated by a globe of fire. The adventurer tells Hasumi Rijui that according to the map, the deepest part of the dungeon is just ahead. As they carry on with their journey, they see a big monster-like figure standing in the fire. The darkness of the place hides the true identity of the monster. As they see them, some of the flakes of fire move toward them. They gradually realize that he is the king of the orcs who is standing in front of them. The orc king is a superhuman with a strength level of 34. 
The king of the orcs holds the unregistered adventurer by his head. Farai gets desperate to see the king of the orcs. She takes out her sword and tries to attack the king of the orcs. However, Hasumi Rijui stops her from doing that. She says they should save him. Hasumi Rijui tells her that the adventurer is already dead. Farai gets sad to hear this. She cries for the dead adventurer. One of the adventurers shouts and tells others to pull back. He says they cannot win against him. Numerous other orcs appear in the place and start to approach them. The orcs hold big logs of wood in their hands as the weapon. They surround them from all directions. One of the adventurers shouts that there is no way to run and escape. He asks what they are supposed to do now. All of them look terrified by the fear of the big orcs. The monstrous king of the orcs walks toward them. His every footstep adds to the fear of the adventurers. The whole situation is in complete chaos. Meanwhile, a big while appears on the floor. One of the adventurers asks others what it is. The other one replies that it is a trap. The old yet strong king of the orcs roars wildly. His roars further add to everyone's fear. The king of the orcs moves his arms and makes adventurers fly in the air like lifeless objects. Two of the adventurers fall into the big hole that appeared on the ground a while before. The other adventurers who stand on the edge of the hole say that no sound can tell them that the fallen people have reached the bottom of the pit. Hasumi Rijui also stands there and observes this. The adventurer says it means they can estimate the depth of the pit. Hasumi Rijui says the bottom of the pit is quite deep. Another adventurer says there is no chance of survival there. Another adventurer holds his head and cries badly. He says they are doomed to die. He says all of them are going to die soon. Faria tries to calm him down and tells him not to give up. The adventurer asks what they should do. The adventurer asks Faria if she is saying that they can win against this mighty monster. Faria shows determination and says she will do something. She takes out a coin and crushes it by her hand. A sharp yellow light starts to come out of her. She takes out her sword and reaches the king of the orcs. She throws biff flames of fire at the orcs with the help of her sword. Soon, the flames of the fire covered the king of the orcs. She puts the king to blaze in the fire. Big clouds of fire and smoke can be seen everywhere in the area. She stands in front of the orc at a distance and notices the next move of the king orc. The orc gets annoyed at her attacks. She notices that the king is unscathed. The angry king takes his big hand close to her. She sits, hopeless to see the big hand coming to her. However, Hasumi Rijui reaches before the king orc. He picks Faria in his arms. She looks at her with a sense of thankfulness. Hasumi Rijui takes her and runs to save their lives. He asks Faria if she is okay. She replies she is fine. She says she is sorry for her recklessness. Hasumi Rijui asks the adventurer if he can leave the mob of orcs to him. Ferre says it will be fine as long as he keeps them preoccupied. The adventurer says that they can manage them just for a few minutes. He still needs to complete the sentence. Hasumi Rijui says he knows there are plenty of orcs. Faria calls Hasumi Rijui and asks if she can help. Hasumi Rijui says it is fine and she should take a rest. The king of the orcs and Hasumi Rijui stands in front of each other. They give each other a look. The king orc growls wildly. He holds his head with his hands and growls again. It seems that Hasumi Rijui has done something to him by using his magical power. Hasumi Rijui looks at the king orc and says he is sorry, but he has no mercy for those who touch his comrades. The king orc loses his balance. He feels hurt and growls to show his pain. The king orc attacks him in turn. Hasumi Rijui blocks his attack and attacks back. They keep fighting with each other on a high note. One of the adventurers says that Hasumi Rijui is giving the orc king a slip. The other one says if he keeps going on like this, he will soon defeat him. Meanwhile, they see a mob of orcs coming towards them. One of them shouts that there is no time to be distracted right now, as a little act of carelessness can cause their death. The adventurers courageously fight with the gigantic monsters. Farius sits aside all these things as she feels weak. He looks at Hasumi Rijui and calls him, who is in direct contact with the king orc then. The king orc swings his big hand in the air to crush Hasumi Rijui with his punch. Hasumi Rijui stands fearlessly in front of him. When the orc is about to do that, Hasumi Rijui takes out a weapon summoning coin from his pocket. He crushes it through his hand and summons a weapon. Purple light emits out. A huge explosion happens. This time he summons an anti-tank landmine. He takes it and throws it towards the orc king. Then he throws a ball of fire towards the orc. 
Hasumi Rijui says manipulating something this heavy with magic power is pretty demanding. The anti-tank landmine hits the orc. A big explosion occurs. Big clouds of fire and smoke appear in the atmosphere. The orc king gets hurt badly. He growls with pain and anger. Hasumi Rijui says it is wrong to think that he will remain unharmed by something that can destroy a whole tank. The orc king takes Hasumi Rijui in his big hand. Hasumi Rijui uses his magic and punches the orc king with full strength. Soon he succeeds in freeing himself from his and knocks the orc king down. The orc king falls into the big hole in the ground. The orc king holds the edges of the hole with his one hand. He tries to come out of the hole, but his efforts end in vain. Hasumi Rijui observes the actions of the orc king. He takes out his knife and hits the orc king. He makes him fall into the hole. Hasumi Rijui keeps standing on the edge of the hole to estimate the depth of the bottom of the pit. He says that with a huge body like the Orc King's, they will succeed in hearing the sound of falling. He thinks, who would think that his mind clearance training could benefit him this way? He looks at the remaining Orcs. His eyes shine with blue light. He says to the Orcs that their boss is dead now. Do they still want to continue the fight with them? The remaining Orcs look at them and growl with anger. They are not willing to run away and they want to continue the fight. The adventurers run toward the orcs and say they can deal with them. They use their magical powers, create balls of fire, and run to throw them onto the orcs. When the adventurers get busy defeating the remaining orcs, Hasumi Rijui walks toward Feria and asks her if she is fine. He asks her if she can walk. She replies that she has recovered now. She stands up, takes hold of her sword, and asks Hasumi Rijui to continue their journey. They went towards the door that the King of Orcs had previously guarded. A sharp yellow light comes out of the door. They stand for a moment and focus their attention on the door. They enter the room. They saw a ball of blazing light suspended in the middle of the air in front of a window. They notice that the key is placed below that ball of light. They walk toward the key. Hasumi Rijui says oh, so there is the key. He brings his hand close to the key and holds it in his hand. Meanwhile, Faria stands still and observes him. The ball of light is the core of the dungeon. Faria notices that the core of the dungeon goes back to its normal state of being. She feels happy and satisfied to see this. Soon, Hasumi Rijui's status window appears and shows that he has achieved the divine key. It also shows that he succeeds in clearing the legendary rank dungeon. The window shows that he has received a title in addition to the other achievements. Hasumi Rijui thinks about the title. Soon, it appears on the status window that he has achieved the title of Legendary Rank Dungeon Traveler. Hasumi Rijui asks Feria what is a title. She tells him that a title is something that is bestowed upon someone after they go through a certain achievement or perform some feat. She tells him about a couple of other titles, such as Mythic Rank Dungeon Traveler, Swordsmanship, Dragon Slayer, Goblin Slayer, and Taming Master. She says having titles means that one will be prioritized while taking the requests, and an extra will be added to the reward. She says more than everything, it brings honor to its bearer. Hasumi Rijui thinks it is something like a unit decoration. Hasumi Rijui checks his status window and says Feria, the titles are not visible to the other's status window. He asks her how one can know about the titles of the others. She tells him that there are appraisals in the guild. She says the guild has every adventurer's status window appraised by them. She says when one achieves a title, he receives a certificate from the guild. Meanwhile, one of the unregistered adventurers says that they are done with defeating the remaining orcs. He adds they can get out at any time. All of them get out of the dungeon. They stand by a green plain. One of the adventurers says they are thankful for the help inside the dungeon. He brings a bag of coins toward Hasumi Rijui and says as per the promise, here are the weapon summoning coins that they collected from the dungeon. He asks Hasumi Rijui to take them as a token of thanks from them. Hasumi Rijui takes the bag of coins from his hands, then he says they can take those coins back. The adventurer asks but why? Hasumi Rijui says to take the coins and in return not tell the king of the Nexus Kingdom about them. He asks if by any chance they open their mouth in front of the king. The adventurer gets his warning and says they do not want to make an enemy who just killed the king of the orcs. The unregistered adventurers go their way. Feria and Hasumi Rijui go their way. On the way Feria asks him why he stopped them from telling the king about them. He says if the king of the Nexus hired them, it is clear enough that he is after the divine key. She says they must come to steal the key if they know about them. She thinks for a while and says this is the gist of it. 
Hasumi Rijui, it is better for them if they do not know of their existence. Hasumi Rijui suddenly stops and jumps at Feria. He holds her head in one of his hands to protect her from injury. He asks her to get down. She is shocked by this sudden action. She asks him what he is doing. Meanwhile, an arrow appears in the notice which someone throws at them. Hasumi Rijui stands up aggressively and asks who is there. A man who has properly covered his face appears behind a tree. From the structure of his ear, he appears to be an elf. Hasumi Rijui looks toward a direction and says they have run away. He thinks it is not a matter of coincidence that they encountered an assassination attempt right after the bat. He says the king of the Nexus or whoever is behind this is quite fast. The scene shifts to Count Maribel's estate. Three of them, Feria, her father, and Hasumi Rijui, sit in the reception hall. Count Maribel says he is greatly thankful for preventing the dungeon from continuously going haywire and saving his territory. Hasumi Rijui says there is no need to say thanks as he has done all this for his reasons. He stops for a while and is about to say something when he reflects upon the previous incidents. He thinks about the words of the looting party that the king hired a party of thieves for the exploration of the dungeon. Then he thinks about the attack on them in the jungle. The count notices his silence. He asks him if he wants to talk about the presence of a looting party in the legendary rank dungeon. Hasumi Rijui tells the count that they said the king of the kingdom of Nexus hired them. The count keeps quiet to hear this. Faria says to her father, he seems unsurprised by the news. She asks if he has any idea why the kind did so. The count thinks for a moment and says there are rumors that the neighboring countries have begun assembling their forces. Faria asks him for what purpose they are assembling their forces. He says dungeons across every territory in the continent are exhibiting accelerated growth rates. He adds the monsters are overflowing out of the dungeons to the surrounding areas. He says there also are regions where crops are being severely affected. He says there are distressing situations everywhere indeed. Feria feels sad to see her father worried. Hasumi Rijui thinks the causes of strife are the same even in this world. The Count says maybe the Royal Highness is planning to conquer the Mythic Range dungeon so that he can fulfill his wish. Hasumi Rijui asks the Count what type of wish. The Count says he wants to put an end to all the strife by uniting the continent. Faria says no way could be possible to accomplish it. The Count says even if he puts the powers of the gods, he might get the mythical rank dungeon. He says a lot of blood will be spilled in the process. He remembers an incident of the past and says that is the reason he advised the Majesty to change his mind when he previously told his ambition. Hasumi Rijui says the reason why he went out of his way and hired a looting party was to infiltrate the dungeon secretly. He says the king wants to keep it a secret from the Count as well. The Count says he is right to say that. He says the Majesty has been reluctant to lend him an ear about it. He adds that despite personally going out of the castle, he refused to grant him an audience. The Count says it is unreasonable of him to ask, but he wants him to conquer the mythical rank to stop the Majesty. Hasumi Rijui says he intended to do this from the very beginning. The scene shifts to a graveyard. Faria and Hasumi Rijui place flowers on the graves. The Count says goodbye to them. They leave the Count's state in a cartridge. It appears as if the cartridge takes them to the kingdom of Nexus. Night prevails everywhere. Faria sits alone on a bench in utter silence. Hasumi Rijui observes her from a distance and comes towards her. He asks her why she cannot sleep. He sits beside her on the bench. She says she thinks that they are going to challenge the task of conquering the mythical rank dungeon tomorrow. He says she knows she can refuse to go with him on this mission. She requests him not to tell her this when it is already too late. She says she has come because she is charmed by Hasumi Rijui after all. She smiles and says her mother advised her to find a good person quickly. She says she found a good person at last. She says she does not want to part ways so easily. Hasumi Rijui says he has a feeling that her mother told her to find a different kind of person when she advised you about that. He asks about her mother. She says her body was frail by nature. She tells him that after the war broke out, the food was not available. She tells him this is how she lost her mother. She asks him about his parents. She asks if his parents are waiting for him in the other world. He says it's similar to what happened to her mother. He feels sad over the talk about his parents. He tells her that his parents passed away when he was just a kid. Faria says she is sorry about that. He asks her not to feel sorry about that. He tells her that many things happened after that and he become a soldier. 
He thinks about his comrades. He tells her that he was part of a unit with men from different countries. He says everyone is different in terms of their way of thinking and habits. He says despite that, they put their lives on the line for the sake of each other. He thinks about the sweet memories of his comrades. He tells her that his comrades are like his family. Faria looks at her with emotion and calls her name. Hasumi Rijui stands up and says he has said too much for today. Hasumi Rijui tells Faria that they will make preparations tomorrow. He adds now they should sleep. She says yes to him. The next day comes. The scene shifts to another place. The streets of the city are empty, and there is no hustle and bustle of the people. Hasumi Rijui feels it is weird. He says to Faria that it is a big city, but it is deserted. She says it was never like this before. She notices a man sitting in a food stall. She says she will go to him and inquire about the situation in the city. She goes to the man who is dozing in the stall. Faria says it looks like the dragon rank dungeon in the outskirts is experiencing rapid growth. She says that he inquired the man about the situation. He said the monsters would appear in the streets and go on a rampage. Hasumi Rijui, so the people evacuated the city, and there was no one left in the city. Faria says the best option for them to do right now is to hurry up and go to the dungeon. They walk on the path of the dragon rank dungeon. The door of the dragon rank dungeon is closed. Two globes of purple fire blaze on both sides of the door. The fire illuminates the gloomy and dark surroundings of the mythical rank dungeon. The dragon rank dungeon is under the possession of the dragon god. Both Hasumi Rijui and Faria hide behind a tree. They see the army soldiers of the Nexus Kingdom. They notice the sign of the dragon on the flag the army soldiers are carrying with them. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui to take a look at something a soldier is giving to the other. She says it looks like it is a divine key. Hasumi Rijui also focuses on the key. The soldier says here is the divine key captain. The captain appreciates the soldier and takes the divine key. The captain says they will begin the dungeon raid right away. He says to the soldier not to take down the guards. The captain takes the swarm of his army and proceeds toward the dragon dungeon gate. He throws the key toward the door to open it. Purple light from the fire globes illuminates the ground situated in front of the door. The captain commands his army to advance. The soldiers proceed to hear the command of their captain. Two of the soldiers stand erect while holding the flags with the sign of a dragon outside the building. Faria and Hasumi Rijui keep observing them. Farai asks why the troops of the Kingdom of Nexus have a divine key. She says that means the Royal Highness hired the looting party to explore the legendary rank dungeon to get the divine key. She asks Hasumi Rijui if that is the case. Hasumi Rijui says yes according to the party, this is the case. She asks if they found a different route down there, or if they discovered another one in some other strange place. Hasumi Rijui says whatever the matter is, they were certainly being beaten. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui if they should go after them and force their way through. He says if worse comes to worse, they do not have any other way around this. She says, but it will be troublesome to take on so many opponents. They hear a rustle in the bushes. Faria takes out her sword and gets ready to fight. Hasumi Rijui reaches for his knife. They both become vigilant. Hasumi Rijui asks who is there. Faria jumps in the air and catches someone. She places her sword on the nose of the captured man. The man takes his hands up and asks her to wait for a while. She says he is the man from before who was sitting in the food stall from whom she inquired about the condition of the city. The man says it is his bad that he followed them. The man tells them that he has come there for his business. Faria says what he means by the business. The man says his occupation is an apothecary. He says he buys ingredients from the adventurers and makes magical portions with them. He says recently, there have been no good ingredients in the royal capital. She says it is so since the dungeons have become more active. She adds that because of this, the circulation of ingredients and materials stagnated. The man says she is right. He says that is why he is looking for the adventurers to get some good ingredients. Hasumi Rijui asks the man why he is telling them these details. The man says that is what his intuition, being a merchant, asks him to do. Both Hasumi Rijui and Faria stare the man. The man says he is telling the truth. The man says the more important thing is that they want to go to the mythical rank dungeon. Foria asks him if he knows a way to go there. The man says a merchant has so many connections. He winks and says he knows a route that is on the backside. The man says he will guide them there. Hasumi Rijui asks him what he wants in exchange. 
The man says they are just required to sell the items and ingredients that they will find inside the mythical rank dungeon. He adds he will buy them at a fair price. Feria is about to say something. The man stops her from saying that. He says not to tell him anything as stuffy and narrow-minded as needed to go through the guild. The man says they are in trouble because of the monopoly of the guild in the first place. Hasumi Rijui agrees to the conditions of the man and asks him to take them to the so-called back entrance. The man says that's the spirit. He takes them to the desired place. He shows them the door to the dungeon. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui to open the door. He says yes and takes the key in front of the door. The door opens with a crack. They enter the door. The man says he is counting on them. Meanwhile, the expressions of the man change and the person who attack Hasumi Rijui and Faria appears over there. The person keeps himself covered in a long gown like before. The man asks that person if it is okay to send them inside. Inside the gown, there is a girl. The girl says that it is not a problem at all. She says the two of them are irrelevant people anyway. Hasumi Rijui and Farai cross the door and enter a corridor. The walls of the corridor are covered with statues of dragons. Many globs of purple fire illuminate the corridor. Faria says so. This is the mythical Rang dungeon. She says the magic is dense here. She says she feels like she is crushed. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui if he is fine. He nods yes, he is fine. He says there are no enemies so that no one would hinder their movements. They step upstairs. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria why it is important to get the key from another dungeon to enter this one. She says that is just how things are. She says she never thought about the reasons behind this. The heavenly voice comes. It says it will clear their doubts about it. Faria looks around and asks who is there. Hasumi Rijui asks her if she can also hear that. She says yes, she can hear it. Hasumi Rijui asks her again if she can still hear it. She says no, she heard it before. Hasumi Rijui asks the divine voice what is the meaning of this. Faria asks him what it is. She asks what is happening. A girl's reflection appears and says she is finally able to reveal her true form. She says that she thinks it is just because of the dense magical power here that it is difficult for her to materialize herself. A ball of stinking light appears before Hasumi Rijui and Faria. They cover their eyes. A figure of a girl appears in the light, almost in the middle of the air. She says she is pleased to meet them. She is wearing a traditional dress. She winks and says she is the heavenly voice. She says she is the goddess Nyx. Faria takes out her sword and raises it towards the heavenly voice. The goddess was shocked at her move. Faria asks her who she is. She further asks her how she appeared out of nowhere, just from thin air. She asks if she is a ghost type of monster or something like that. Goddess Nyes holds the shoulders of Hasumi Rijui in fear. She says they are mistaken. She is not a monster. She asks Hasumi Rijui to say something. She hides behind him. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui if he knows her. Hasumi Rijui says he has yet to learn who she is. Farai again tries to attack her. She says she knows she is an enemy. Hasumi Rijui says it was after entering this world that he first heard her. He reminds her of when she welcomed her as a hero from another world. He tells Faria that she first talked to him when he entered this world. He adds that she had introduced herself as a heavenly voice back then. He says that she talked to him in his native language. He reminds something. He says she taught him things about this world. He says that at first he doubts his sanity, but now he feels relaxed that Faria can also hear her. Both Hasumi Rijui and Faria look at her. Nick says that was not the case in reality. She smiles and says she would like to introduce herself again. She says she is Goddess Nyx. She says she is one of the thousands of gods that exist in this world. Faria wonders if a goddess manifested before them in reality. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria if Nyx is a famous goddess. Faria says it is the first time she has heard her name. Hasumi Rijui says that she must stand in a low place among the gods. He adds she must be among the small gods. Nyx shouts and says she hears everything they say about her. Farai wants to ask her something. Nyx feels her hesitation. She asks her if she is the one who brought Hasumi Rijui into this world. She asks her for what purpose she brought him into this world. Nyx says she brought him into this world so that he could conquer all the mythic range dungeons that exist in this world. She steps downstairs. Faria and Hasumi Rijui follow her. Nyx tells them a god administers every dungeon. She says that the dragon dungeon is administered by the god Fafnir. 
In mythology, Fafnir is the son of the dwarf King Haradmer, who became a great dragon and was later slain by the hero Sigurd. She says that means her follower monsters and their subordinates administer the dungeon and its surroundings. She says since the legendary range dungeon and the Radom Kingdom dungeon have connections. She says that is the reason that the divine key is to be located in the deepest part of the legendary rank dungeon. Hasumi Rijui thinks for a moment about all these details. Then he asks Nyx what she wants to achieve by making him conquer all the dungeons of this world. Nyx thinks for a while. Hasumi Rijui gazes at her. He uses his power against her. Nyx asks him why he is doing so when he has not said anything weird yet. She falls to the ground. Meanwhile, a dragon attacks them. They look at the dragon. The fire-breathed dragon comes down to the ground. Hasumi Rijui asks the dragon to bow down his head. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui to calm down and wait for some time. She looks at Nyx and says a goddess can defeat a monster like that easily. Hasumi Rijui says that makes sense. Nyx says she cannot do that. She says right now, her materialization level is quite low to fight with a dragon. Nyx says she cannot even lift a stone right now with a low level of power. Hasumi Rijui and Faria look at her and think about something. Nyx keeps sitting in her place. Hasumi Rijui takes out his knife and says that she should remain aside from the whole matter. Hasumi Rijui says it would be troublesome to deal with the dragon if he could fly as well. The dragon stares at Hasumi Rijui. On the other hand, Hasumi Rijui stands in a pose ready for action. He thinks that flying the dragon must require some run-ups. He thinks with a determination that he will defeat the dragon before he gets a chance to fly. Hasumi Rijui uses magical power and quickly reaches the backside of the dragon. He dodges the dragon and reaches his head. He prepares to hit on the head of the dragon. The dragon opens his mouth and growls when he is about to hit him on his head. The chest of the dragon enlightens with the power of fire. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria to dodge the dragon. The dragon gets the opportunity to fly and releases a breath full of fire flames. The dragon targets Faria. Faria tries to block his attack, but she loses her balance. Hasumi Rijui calls out her name to see her in danger. Hasumi Rijui tries to reach her to see her falling. He brings her hand close to her to save her. But Faria fails to hold his hand and falls into a pit. Hasumi Rijui calls her desperately as he watches her fall into a pit. He asks Faria to gather her strength and calm down. He says this way, she will fall on the ground. The dragon follows her into the deep pit. She gathers her strength and takes hold of her sword. She attacks the dragon with the help of her sword and throws fire onto the dragon. She maintains her balance in the air and safely lands on the ground. Faria cries and says she has done that somehow, but she has used her magic to do that. She says it would be quite bad to turn into a monster. Some snake-like thing moves in the darkness. Faria tries to figure it out. The scene shifts to Hasumi Rijui, who feels sad to see Faria's life in danger. He then thinks that she must be fine as she can use magic. Nyx call Hasumi Rijui. She asks if he is listening to her. Meanwhile, the monster appears again. Hasumi Rijui says to Nyx that he will kill the dragon first, and then he will listen to her. The dragon releases a heavy breath full of fire flames. Nyx tries to save herself from the fire. She tries to divert the attention of the dragon. Hasumi Rijui says good and asks her to keep diverting the attention of the dragon. Nyx says to Hasumi Rijui that he is treating her harshly. He says there is no other way as she cannot fight right now. He says she will not die easily because she is a goddess. She shouts she may be a goddess, but scary things are still scary. Hasumi Rijui runs in the opposite direction. Nyx asks if she is being ignored. Hasumi Rijui reaches a corner of the place and observes the movements of the dragon. He waits for the right time to attack. He observes the dragon and says that the front side of the monster is weak especially their throat. Then he focuses on the throat of the dragon and thinks that the throat of the dragon houses the part that enables him to release fire. He thinks if he attacks the throat of the dragon, then he will be able to defeat the monster. In addition, if he attacks the dragon from the place he is standing, neither his fairy breath nor his tail can hit him. Then he thinks flying and shortening the distance will be a useful trick to defeat the dragon. When he plans to kill the dragon, the dragon attacks him, and he says it is too late to do that. He jumps at the dragon. The dragon roars. Hasumi Rijui makes a courageous move. He comes in direct contact with the dragon and hits him on his throat with his knife. The dragon bleeds. Hasumi Rijui feels the accumulated air has been released. 
Meanwhile, he sees Nyx falling to the ground. He reaches her quickly and holds her. Nyx grips the shirt of Hasumi Rijui to get support. She cries and says they are going to die. Hasumi Rijui calms her down. Hasumi Rijui places Nyx on the ground. He says he is seen there is a salient down in the pit. She asks him to tell her if he knows anything else. He checks his status window and says that his level went up. He says his level increased after killing the wyvern. He asks Nyx if seeing that type of thing is a matter of usual routine. Nyx ignores his question and says oh wow, his level and magical powers have increased. Hasumi Rijui complains that she is too noisy. He says cheering like kids is not necessary. Nyx says it is something conventional to do that. Hasumi Rijui says if she makes noise, the monsters will come over there. Nyx puts her hand on her mouth and says she will stay quiet onwards. Both Hasumi Rijui and Niz jump into the pit. They use magic to land on the ground safely. She says it is expected that the gods have discerning judgment. She says it is amazing that he has defeated a wyvern without using magical powers. He says he can use magic. He says however, he has no other choice. Nick says he cannot use magic. Hasumi Rijui says it seems that she is unaware of that fact on the way to the royal capital. He remembers that Faria told him about the four magical elements. Fire, wind, water and earth. She told him those who have magical powers of fire try to bring forth the power of fire. She said that is the reason that the power of fire comes first. He says she is right that most people use the power of fire. He says it is something that can only be created with the will to do so. So, it is the most suitable thing to be created by magic. That is why people commonly use it. Hasumi Rijui remembers Faria's words that the power of fire creates the oldest magic in the world. He tells Nyx that he has used it many times after Faria told him about it. He tells her that he has never succeeded in doing so. He says he has plenty of magical powers in him, but he can use them. He says he seems to have this sort of connection. Nyx says here is a mistake. Hasumi Rijui asks her what sort of mistake. She says it is a mistaken idea that humans have. Nyx tells Hasumi Rijui that the power of fire is not important to begin with. Nyx says that this is because the element or elements one is proficient in using varies from person to person. Hasumi Rijui says is thought so. Then he thinks if it is like that, he thinks he can use magic. The scene shifts to Faria. She fights with the snake-like creatures in the depths of the dungeon. She uses her skills of swordsmanship and cuts some of the snake-like creatures. The creatures try to dominate her. One of them sticks to her leg. She tries to cut the creature with her sword, but before she can do that, the snake-like creature holds her hand. She to free herself from the grip of those things, she cries out for help. The monster tries to swallow her. She calls Hasumi Rijui for help. Faria keeps struggling against the monster. She says she cannot die in a place like this. She says Hasumi Rijui will surely come to help her. She says she has to survive. She asks the monster to free her from his grip. The monster traps her in his snake-like parts. The monster takes her near his mouth. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui appears over there and cuts the snake-like limbs of the monster. He frees Faria from the grip of the monster. When he cuts the snake-like limbs of the monster, Faria falls from a height. He immediately reaches her and holds her in his arms. Faria closes her eyes due to the fear of falling. Then he feels someone has held her in his arms. She opened her eyes and saw Hasumi Rijui. He smiles and says he has performed a good job. They reach the ground and look at the monster. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui what happened to Nyx. He tells her that he has left her behind because she is quite slow. He says she is more or less a goddess. She can save herself. He says right now, they should focus their attention on the monster as it is lying before them to deal with. He says it appears that they can only go ahead if they defeat the monster. So that means they have no other option but to defeat the monster to carry on their journey. He thinks about how they can defeat the monster. He focuses his attention on the monster to defeat him. Faria asks her how they are going to defeat the monster. He says to leave it to him, he will figure it out. He runs toward the monster. He uses his magical power to increase his speed and reaches the monster in no time. Faria seems terrified to see him dealing with the monster alone. She calls out his name. He struggles to deal with the snake-like limbs of the monster. The minster takes out his snake-like structures to get a hold of him. Then he stands still. Faria notices that he is allowing the monster to entangle him with his tentacles. Hasumi Rijui has already figured out the plan to defeat the monster by now. 
He takes out a coin and crushes it in his hand. He throws the pieces. This time, he summons bombs. He jumps toward the mouth of the monster. He throws the bombs into his mouth and tells the monster to eat them if he is so hungry. The monster gulps so many bombs. The bombs reach the abdomen of the monster when he gulps them. Then, an explosion occurs. Huge clouds of fire and smoke can be seen in the area. Feria covers her eyes to avoid the spark of the explosion. Meanwhile, Nyx also reaches there. She also covers her eyes with her arms. Feria notices her presence. Nyx says it is so cruel of Hasumi Rijui that he left her behind. Nyx sees the monster and says she is going to be eaten by the monster. Hasumi Rijui says not to create a fuss as the monster is already dead. He ignores Nyx's drama. Feria walks toward Hasumi Rijui. She says she is sorry. She feels sad. Hasumi Rijui asks her why she is saying sorry. She replies she is sorry because it is because of her they came across so many unnecessary troubles to deal with. She says that in addition, he used his valuable weapon, summoning coins while dealing with the monster. He looks at her and says there is no need to feel sorry about that. He says that was not her mistake. He tells her that his weapon summoning coins have increased in number as there are so many of them lying on the ground right now. He looks at the door in front of him and says besides, the right door to reach the dungeon is right there. Meanwhile, some big bats attack them. Both Feria and Hasumi Rijui take out their weapons to deal with them. Feria takes out her sword and uses her fire magic to deal with them. At the same time, Hasumi Rijui uses her sharp knife to deal with them. However, Nyx remains passive as she does not fight with any of them. Hasumi Rijui cuts the throat of one of them and stands on its dead body. Nyx cheers to see him killing the bat. Meanwhile, another monster appears over there. Feria cuts the throat of that monster by using her sword and fire magic. Hasumi Rijui as they expected, there are plenty of monsters to deal with. He says they are in plenty because this time they are trying to conquer the mythical Rang dungeon. Feria feels sad and asks him if she is a burden on him. Hasumi Rijui says no, she is not a burden at all. Nyx laughs and says if he insists, what will it make it? They both look at her. Nyx says she is better than her, so he should be grateful for her presence over there. Hasumi Rijui says rather it should be the other way around here. Nyx gets mad and asks what he said. Hasumi Rijui says that in the battle, it is pointless to have an existence of someone unable to fight. He addresses Feria and says one should make the best of one's existence along with comrades against enemies, that's it. Feria says she understands his point, she still feels sad and hopeless. Hasumi Rijui reminds her that when the goblins caught her, she continued to deal with the situation to save the children. He reminds her that how she did not give up at that time. She asks him what that incident has to do with the current situation. Hasumi Rijui says the best thing on the battlefield is not to give up. He adds the most important thing on the battlefield is not to give up and to survive. Freya feels motivated to hear the words of Hasumi Rijui. Nyx looks in front of her and says it seems that they have reached a vast space. They walk toward an edge. Nyx looks in depth and makes a sad and terrified face. Looking at her expression, Hasumi Rijui asks her what is the matter. Hasumi Rijui and Feria also reach the edge. Feria looks down and puts her hands on her mouth as if she has seen something awful. Then Hasumi Rijui looked down and an expression of concern could be seen on his face. There are so many dead bodies of soldiers of the army of the capital. Their bodies can be seen on the pointed edges of rocks. That scenario makes all three of them stand and think for a while. One of them says they must be the troops that enter the dungeon before them. Nyx says this is such a cruel act. Fere asks Hasumi Rijui to go back. She says this is so dangerous. Hasumi Rijui says yes, it is dangerous. He stands still and thinks something. Feria asks him if there is something. He says they have no other option but to go forward. Feria feels sad to hear his words and again looks into depth. They begin to walk through the edges. As they begin walking, Nyx asks if it is fine to go. She says she does not want to get impaled like this. Hasumi Rijui says this is different for being pierced from below. He says they have fallen from a considerable height. He says that means they are fine as long as they are not carried to the sky. Nyx says oh that is great. She says then she can rest assured. Soon they see another monster flying in the sky. The monster takes Nyx with him. Feria asks Hasumi Rijui if Nyx is a goddess in reality as she does not look like one. Feria asks Hasumi Rijui to go after Nyx to save her. 
Hasumi Rijui thinks about where that monster comes from. He thinks there is no sign of its presence. He looks toward the monster who is taking Nyx away. He says he is heading toward a different area than what it was a moment before. Faris says he is right. They both run after the monster to reach him. He says ominous magical power is lowing from a gigantic body. She tells him that he is the dungeon master. She says he is Fafnir, the god of dragons. While running, Hasumi Rijui calls Feria and says Nyx told him that it is not necessary to start with the magic of fire. He adds she told him that the elements vary from person to person. He says that when he heard that, it occurred to him. He asks if it would be possible for water magic to be the magic you are most proficient at. Faria seems confused. He says it is just his guess based on the movements of her sword. He says her sword movements look like flowing water rather than violent fire. Faria asks him why he is saying something like that right now. She looks at him and tries to figure out the purpose of saying that. Hasumi Rijui says he said it before, didn't he? He adds that on the battlefield, they have to get the best of the conditions. He says they do not know what is ahead of them, but they should do everything that they can do. Faria looks at him and tries to understand his point. She says he is right to say this. They reach under the claws of the dragon. The dragon flies through closure and enters another place. They enter the same place while chasing him. The dragon reaches a door. The dragon puts Nyx down to the ground. Faria calls out to her. Hasumi Rijui says it seems that Nyx is unconscious right now. The dragon opens its mouth and emits a big ball of fire. Hasumi Rijui says there comes an attack. He tells Faria to avoid it. Fry runs and manages to block the attack. She says she will create an opportunity for them. She says she will attack at the moment. Hasumi Rijui understands her point and says okay to it. Faria takes out her sword and makes a hit on the ball of fire. The ball of fire moves back to the monster. Hasumi Rijui says she has done a good job as the attention of the monster is diverted. Hasumi Rijui says he got his chance. He runs toward the monster. He takes out his knife and hits the dragon in the right place. The dragon falls to the ground. Faria says happily that he has done it. However, Hasumi Rijui feels that there is something weird. He says she got less of a response in return. He says his magic manipulation power should have increased, but still, something is weird. He wonders if the monster is weaker than the dragon with whom he dealt in the past. He says this is not possible. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria to fall back. Meanwhile, Nyx also wakes up. He asks her to go back. He notices cracks on the floor. Something comes out of the floor. Nyx hits by that and show away in the air. Farai covers her eyes. Hasumi Rijui looks at the thing to comprehend the situation. Then he looks at the dragon. He notices movement in the body of the dragon. The dragon stands up, and his body shines with the lines of fire on the curves. The dragon looks at them. He says they seem to be more interesting to deal with than the trash he dealt with before. He must be talking about the troops. Faria and Nyx feel terrified to see him. The god of the dragon stands before them as a sign of danger. The notification on the status window shows that the dragon good Fafir has appeared. The dragon growls. Fere tells Hasumi Rijui that he is Fafnir, the dungeon's guardian beast. She says it is futile to fight with him. She says there is no chance that they can defeat him. Hasumi Rijui looks at the dragon with a thoughtful expression. The dragon beast Fafnir says that he felt an odd presence. He says it seems they have a traitor here. Nyx looks at Fafnir. Hasumi Rijui asks her what he is saying. Fafnir laughs. Fafnir says to Nyx how foolish it is that she has opposed them, the Ten Pillar Gods. He adds it turns out that she has to rely on the humans at the end. Hasumi Rijui seems unable to understand what he is saying. He asks Nyx if he can go back to his original world. Nyx replies that he can return to his original world, but to do that, he has to conquer the ten dungeons of the mythical rank that exist in that world. Hasumi Rijui says he got her point. Faria asks what it is. He says he does not know the details. He adds that the gods are not a monolithic faction. Fafnir says that a smart human being is also present there. Fafnir laughs and says he seems to be quite powerful. The Fafnir asks Hasumi Rijui to become his servant instead of fighting against him. Meanwhile, many small dragons appear around Fafnir. He says if he becomes his servant, he will grant his every wish. Hasumi Rijui says he wants to ask him something. Fafnir asks what is that thing? He asks him if he becomes his servant, will he be able to return to his original world then? Fafnir says another world. He gets mad to know that he is from another world. 
he calls Nix a scum and says she has summoned a human from another world to defeat them. Hasumi Rijui thinks it appears that there are two powers in the gods. He comprehends that Fafnir's side being is ten pillars gods. That says that presumed to the ruling group. He says that Nix's side is the traitor. He says it is the same in every world. Fafnir says returning to his original world is a difficult task. He says that fulfilling such a grand wish is not possible. He says he can return to his original world by winning all the ten dungeons and robbing the treasure of the ten pillars gods. He says that fulfilling the requirements is indispensable to return to his original world. He says that it is impossible for a human being to fulfill that task. Hasumi Rijui stands still to hear his words. Fafnir says it is not significant to return to his original world if he can get everything that he desires, including wealth. He says he can even achieve fame over there. Nix tells Hasumi Rijui not to think about these things, she says it is true that conquering the ten dungeons is an arduous task to fulfill. She says there are times when she thought about joining the party of ten pillars of gods to be more advantageous. She says that even so, this is not the right state of being. Hasumi Rijui says he feels sorry. Nix cries badly. She appears shattered. Fafner looks at Hasumi Rijui to hear his answer. Hasumi Rijui says he rejects his proposal. Fafnir says that means he wants to oppose the Ten Gods. Hasumi Rijui says yes, he adds he has seen this happening many times. He says people often get tempted by such offers and betray their comrades. He says that kind of people mostly regret it later. He says he has no intention of betraying his comrade. Both Faria and Nix feel relaxed to hear his words. He says he will not do that type of act no matter if he is in this world or his original world. Fafni says oh it is so. He says here he sees him as a promising fellow. He says he knows that humans are foolish creatures. He says then die here. He attacks him with fire to kill him. Hasumi Rijui jumps and manages to avoid his attack. Fafnir's attack creates a big hole in the floor. The pieces of rocks fly in the air. Faria feels concerned about him and calls his name. Hasumi Rijui understands that Fafnir has connected the elements of fire and earth to attack. Fafnir attacks him with heavy flames of fire one after another. Hasumi Rijui keeps avoiding his attacks and manages to save himself. Faria takes out her swords and tries to attack Fafnir. Fafnir this time targets her to see this. Farai looks terrified, with tears in her eyes. Fafnir's heavy attacks fill the atmosphere with clouds of fire and smoke. In addition, his attacks create big holes on the floor. Fafnir teases Hasumi Rijui to see him simply avoiding his attacks. He says this is quite disappointing. His prowess merely amounted to this. He growls and says he should finish off. He looks at Nix and Faria and says he should finish the remaining little girl and the traitor now. Fafnir attacks both Faria and Nix. Faria tries to attack him again, but Nix holds her hand and flies toward the sky. Faria asks her what she is doing. Nix says they are running away from this place. Nix asks Faria if she can win against Fafnir. Faria seems answerless. Nix says they should leave that place in that case. Nix says she should not have involved humans in the fight between gods. She says at least they should survive right now in this scenario. Fafnir reaches them and says as if he is allowing them to escape. Fafnir releases another heavy ball of fire toward them. The ball of fire hits them. Both Faria and Nix fall to the ground. Fafnir says how small and hard it is to aim human beings. Faria thinks Hasumi Rijui kills dragons so easily, but where is he now? Fafnir asks them to give up and says neither of them has any chance to escape. Farai stands up and says that in that case, they do not have any other choice but to defeat him. Fafnir opens his big mouth and laughs. He ridicules Faria's words. He asks if she has gone mad out of fear. Fafnir asks Faria how she can defeat him with her meager magical powers. Nix is still lying on the ground. She says to Faria that Fafnir is saying right they cannot defeat him. She adds even Hasumi Rijui fails to do so. She raises her sword toward Fafnir and says even so, she will not give up. Fafnir says then go ahead and realize her powerlessness. He says she will die a hopeless death. Freya holds the hand of Nix. She asks Nix to fly her up close to Fafnir. She says to leave the directions to her. Nix takes Faria from behind and flies. She takes her to the height. Fafnir again attacks them to see that. Nix says they are going to collapse again. Faria asks Nix to dodge Fafnir. She asks her to go left, then to go right. Then she asks her to go up. 
they fly in different directions and avoid Fafnir's attacks. In addition to this, they manage to dodge him. They soon reach near the head of Fafnir. Fafnir feels irritated. Then they flew towards the door, which was closed at that time. Fafnir says oh they are after the sacred treasure from the beginning. He says what a human way of thinking is. He again starts to throw fireballs at Faria and Nyx. Faria falls to the ground and goes almost unconscious. Then, he orders one of his subservient dragons to kill them. Nyx sees the dragon going toward Faria. She calls her and informs her that the dragons are coming towards her. Faria opens her eyes and looks at them. She tries to gather her strength and gets a hold of her sword. She thinks it is the end. Then, she negates that thought. She reminds Hasumi Rijui that they should do everything that they can to survive on the battlefield. She takes the support of her sword and gets up. She again reminds Hasumi Rijui words that she may be proficient in water magic. She gives his words to the second thought. She thinks about the magic of water. She invokes the power of water magic. She opens her eyes, and her eyes shine with a different sort of magical strength. The words of Hasumi Rijui have practical implications for her magical proficiency. She gets ready to fight again. This time, she tries her hand at the magic of water. She creates waves of water through her sword. The dragon gets hit by her magical powers. She looks hopeful and determined to win against dragons and to survive. Nyx holds Faria and asks her if she is fine. Fafnir says oh it is half bad. He adds that it seems that she has exhausted her magical powers. He opens his mouth once again and throws a huge ball of fire toward them. He says this is the end now. Faria and Nyx say no, this is not the end, as the fight has not ended yet. Both of them stand up and smile to see something. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui appears on the scene, all ready to attack the dragon. He jumps high upward and reaches the head of Fafnir. Oro of Hasumi Rijui's magical power can be seen around him in the form of a red light. He takes out his knife and aims at the head of Fafnir. He thrusts the knife into the brain of Fafnir. Blood gushes out of his head and he growls wildly. Hasumi Rijui jumps down to the ground. Fafnir growls in pain and fiery sparks come out of his body. Both Faria and Nick run towards Hasumi Rijui. Faria says that it is amazing that he returned unscathed. She adds he has performed a wonderful job in defeating Fafnir. Hasumi Rijui says that she also did well in the fight against Fafnir. She says not at all. She again reminds his words that she may be proficient at water elemental magic. She says it all thanks to his guidance. Nyx asks Hasumi Rijui how he managed to survive. She says he got hit by a full-blown attack. He says that just before he got hit by Fafnir's tail, he surrounded himself with magical power. Both Faria and Nyx feel surprised to hear that. Nyx says it seems that he was already prepared for the attack. Faria smiles and says well, this is not the first time. Nyx says he should have told them about that. They talk to each other about how they managed to survive. Meanwhile, Fafnir wakes up and says how a low-race human dared to injure him. He gets mad and says this is something unforgivable. He growls wildly, and a huge magical aura travels toward the three of them. They try to cover themselves to block the attack. Hasumi Rijui runs toward Fafnir and tells Faria and Nyx to stay aside. He says he will manage to deal with him. Fafnir stands up and says they are so foolish that they can defeat him with a surprise attack. He says another surprise attack like the previous one would not be able to defeat him. Hasumi Rijui says he knows that. He says that is why he is fighting his head on. Fafnir again attacks him and fires fire toward him. Hasumi Rijui manages to avoid the attacks. Hasumi Rijui focuses on Fafnir's attack modes. He thinks that it seems that he cannot attack in the opposite direction. He says he merely uses a breath attack towards two of them. He says that the holy treasure is extremely important. He says in addition that Fafnir is the same as any other monster. He remembers his previous fights with the monsters. He thinks physical attacks will work to deal with him. He thinks about using physical attacks to damage him. Fafnir gets mad at his continued struggle. Hasumi Rijui looks at him. Fafnir asks him to quit his prancing around. He moves in another direction and attacks Hasumi Rijui again. His body shines with shiny firelight as he growls in anger and frustration. Hasumi Rijui jumps to move and avoid his attacks. Meanwhile, he takes out the weapon summoning coins. He throws weapon summoning coins in the air. Faria and Nyx notice his move. Nyx says he is spilling weapon summoning coins around them to make his magical power work. Hasumi Rijui says he has become so accustomed to manipulating this so-called magical power. 
He says that he has learned to do these things by now. He uses magic and crushes weapon summoning coins, a weapon appears over there. This time he summons a 12.7 mm Calabar anti-material rifle, PGM Hecate Roman II. Fafnir gets mad to see this. He calls Hasumi Rijui a bastard. He says how he, a low-race human, dares to defy a god. It seems difficult for him to accept the challenging manners of a human. Hasumi Rijui says he is sorry about that. He adds that from where he comes, God is said to be dead. He holds the rifle in his hand, puts his figure on the trigger, and aims at Fafnir. He shoots Fafnir right between two eyes. Fafnir gets hit by the shot and growls in pain. Fire flames come out of him as if he is a firecracker. His body curves shine with the fire. Both Furia and Nyx look shocked. Hasumi Rijui comes back to the ground. Fafnir falls to the ground. The other dragons growl to see him falling to the ground. Fafnir says he will regret for not obeying them. Hasumi Rijui says whether he regrets it or not, he is the one who decided to go against you. He smiles to see his success in the mission. Both Faria and Nyx look happy. They run toward Hasumi Rijui. A sword appears over there. Nyx holds it and gives it to Hasumi Rijui. She tells them that it is the sword of the God of Dragons and the treasure of the Dragon Dungeon. She says that it is the Phantasm Sword of Rissel. Soon, troops appear around them. Hasumi Rijui says these are surviving troops. One of the soldiers says they hide to save themselves. The captain says they are planning to seize the opportunity to escape by using them as a decoy. He says it is good to see that he killed the dragon god. He adds that things have become convenient for them now. He says he appreciates their efforts and the spirit with which they go through all the trouble. Hasumi Rijui looks back to see who is there. One of the troops removes his mask and asks them to hand over the sword to him. He opens his hand and asks Hasumi Rijui to hand over the phantasm sword to him. Nick says he is so dumb. The soldier gets mad at her comment and asks what did she say in anger. She says he is such a foolish man to think that he can defeat someone who has defeated the dragon god Fafnir. The captain clinches his teeth in anger. One of the soldiers asks him what will they do now. The captain tells him not to flatter because of the comment. He says he must be exhausted after fighting with the dragon god. He commands all of his soldiers to seize Hasumi Rijui. The soldiers say yes to the command of their captain. Three of them get ready to fight again. Hasumi Rijui here they go again. He says he is extremely tired, but he has to fight. Hasumi Rijui notices the movements of the soldiers. He says the movements of the soldiers are quite straight. Hasumi Rijui hits a soldier with a heavy punch and makes him fly in the air. The other soldiers get mad at this. They say how dare he hit their comrade. Hasumi Rijui feels that the team's coordination is off too. Hasumi Rijui poses a heroic pose and punches another soldier in the head. Soldier falls to the ground. A soldier tries to attack him from behind with a sword. When he tries to hit him with a sword, Hasumi Rijui moves aside and hits his comrade instead. Soon he knocks down all the troops. The captain wonders why their elite troops fail to deal with magic in no time. Hasumi Rijui comes close to the captain and asks him what his plan is now. He asks him if he also wants to get down by him. The captain seems answerless and stammers in confusion. Farai looks at the captain and says she knows him. The captain says look who is there. He asks Faria if she is Count Mirabel's daughter. He says the dungeon they are in right now is in the jurisdiction of his royal highness. He says it is a matter of high offense as they are exploring the dungeon without permission. Faria asks what he is trying to say selfishly. She says if they are not, who betrayed their trust in the first place? She says they hired a dungeon looter party and asked them to the legendary rank dungeon in the territory of the Count without his permission. She says what would they say about that? The captain was impressed and said oh they know that much. He thinks this is troublesome. He thinks he should dispose of them. He says he does not know what she is talking about. Foray says he should not try to show his ignorance when he is well aware of the facts. He asks if she has any proof to prove that. He adds on the other hand, his troops, and he witnessed their action through their eyes. He says he wonders whom his majesty will believe. Nick says this is so underrated. The captain says, then hands over the phantasm sword to him if they want to avoid punishment. Meanwhile, another girl appears over there. She says it is not necessary to do that. Nick panics to see the girl. Hasumi Rijui wonders when she arrives over there. The girl holds a black ball. The ball emits a powerful magical aura. 
Meanwhile, a door opened, and they came out of it. They enter the forest. Hasumi Rijui and Faria follow her. She asks where is the other girl. Nyx tells them she cannot materialize herself out of the dungeon. Hasumi Rijui says explaining things about her circumstances would be complicated. He adds she does not need to worry about her anyway. The girl says okay. Faria asks the girl girls if she is okay with this much explanation. She says yes, she is fine. Hasumi Rijui asks her who she is. He says she is the one who attacked them before. Hasumi Rijui remembers the forest attack. The girl says she is sorry about that. Faria says she seems like the kind of person who cannot read the pace of the conversation. Hasumi Rijui says he guesses so. The girl says she will tell them straight. She says she wishes them to save the life of the king of Nexus. She removes her cap and shows her face. Hasumi Rijui conforms if she wants them to save the life of the king of Nexus. Faria asks the girls what she means by that. She says your highness hired a party of looters. She adds the majesty is betraying them. The girl says they are wrong to think that. The real traitor is the captain of the army. Hasumi Rijui asks her to explain the whole matter in detail. The girl thinks for a moment. The girl tells them under the pretext of an illness. The army captain has confined your majesty. She adds that while pretending to be under the orders of your majesty, he has been acting for his benefit. Faria asks the girl then, what about hiring a looting party of unregistered adventurers to explore the legendary rank dungeon? She says the looting party told them the monarch of the kingdom hired them. She adds the captain told them that he had orders to kill them. The girl says the captain does all these things. Hasumi Rijui says everything makes sense now. Faria asks him what he means. Hasumi Rijui says to remember what the captain said if they have proof to prove their point. He repeats the words of the captain that he and the other troops have witnessed their action. He wonders whom the majesty will believe. He says it was the same case for him as he also has no concrete proof against them. He says in reality, it would not matter whom the king will believe. The captain was trying to capture them in his scapegoat and wanted to place the whole blame on them. Faria says she is right. Hasumi Rijui says he wants to ask one more question. The girl says what it is. He asks why he ordered the looting party to explore the dungeon despite already having a divine key with them. She tells him that he did not have the divine key. First, he got it from the royal palace treasury after the looting party fiasco. Hasumi Rijui says the situation is quite bad in that case. Faria asks him what he means by that. He says he and his men are trying to get control of the royal palace. Faria says in that case, the more time they pass, the more the life of the king will be in danger. Hasumi Rijui thinks that means people do not change regardless of the world they are in. Faria says in that case, they need to hurry and save the life of the king. Hasumi Rijui says there is a thing about which he wants to be sure. She says what it is. He asks her what will happen to the phantasm sword Rissel. He says he still needs to get authorization from the country to explore the mythical Rang dungeon. She says dungeon loot belongs to the person who attains them. She says that as far as the matter of getting authorization goes, she got it from the king. She says she can handle this matter. Hasumi Rijui says all right, then he will give her a hand in the king's rescue mission. The scene shifts to the kingdom of Naxos. They proceed toward the royal palace. There are guards on the main gate of the palace. They are protecting the main gate from a height. Farai runs toward the main gate. Tea guards call for help and say that something serious is happening. They see Faria running and see someone is there. Faria stops at a distance from the gate. She tries to normalize herself. She says to the guard that she is Faria, daughter of Count Mirabel. She says she is passing by the royal capital. She adds she has seen a group of monsters heading toward the back gate of the palace. The guards talk to each other. One of them asks how this can happen. There is no way. Meanwhile, big clouds of smoke and fire appear on the backside of the palace. She asks the guards to hurry up and send some troops to that place. Faria thinks she is confident in her acting, but will it work? It was Hasumi Rijui who made an explosion in the back of the palace. He even throws a bomb inside the palace to create an explosion. The explosion creates a hole in the wall of the palace, big enough to enter. The guards reach the place where there is fire. They wonder that there are no monsters. One of them sends the other in a different direction and asks him to check over there. Hasumi Rijui and the girl hide behind a tree. Hasumi Rijui says that with this explosion, perimeter security will be weakened. The girl thinks that the magic that the boy uses is amazing. 
Then, she wonders if it is a magical tool that he uses. Hasumi Rijui sees her thinking something. He asks the girl what is the matter. She says nothing. He asks her to let go in. She says yes to him. She thinks Hasumi Rijui is an interesting fellow. When the guards are busy checking the cause of the explosion, they get a chance to get into the palace. Hasumi Rijui asks the girl where the king is being held in the palace. She tells him that the king is on the last floor of the east tower. She says she will guide him there. Then she shows him direction. The scene shifts to the east tower of the royal palace. Two guards are there to protect the stairs of the east tower. Hasumi Rijui and the girl hide themselves behind a wall. They check out the guards. The girl tells Hasumi Rijui that this is the only entrance and exit to go there. He says that means there is no other chance then. Hasumi Rijui calls a guard while hiding behind the wall. He asks the guard to come over there for a while. The guard walks toward the wall. When he reaches there, Hasumi Rijui holds the guard by the neck and attacks him. Meanwhile, another guard comes over there. He sees Hasumi Rijui beating the guard. He asks him what he is doing. Hasumi Rijui pushes the guard to the ground and runs away. The girl runs with him. They reach the stairs and go upstairs. Hasumi Rijui again asks the girl that the king is on the last floor. The girl says yes to him. Before they took another step, they saw the captain standing on the stairs. The captain says he knows that they will come to the royal palace. He tells them not to take another step. He laughs and says it is dangerous to get too close to them. He says he can deal with them from a distance. The girl asks how he will do that. She says that it would be impossible for him to manage that. Meanwhile, troops reach there and surround them. Hasumi Rijui says the reason he is trying to keep them at a distance is to make them get into a trap. The captain says that is right. Hasumi Rijui looks at the troops. The captain asks them what they will do now. The soldiers take out the fiery arrows and aim at them. The captain says they are special magic archers. He says their bodies will burst into pieces when their arrows pierce them. The full group of magic archers aim their arrows at them. The captain asks them to surrender without resistance. He asks Hasumi Rijui to hand over the phantasm sword Rissel to him. Hasumi Rijui thinks he cannot kill that number of soldiers. He remembers the request of the girl. She requested him not to kill any of the soldiers of the palace. She told him that many soldiers of the palace did not know that the captain was scheming against the king. He thinks in case he has to let the soldiers live. He says he has no choice but to proceed like this. He picks the girl on his shoulders. The captain shouts that he will let their useless effort work. He commands the soldiers to fire the arrows. The soldiers fire the arrows instantly. Hasumi Rijui quickly steps up and reaches the captain. He captures the captain. He puts his knife on the neck of the captain. The captain commands the soldiers to drop their weapons. The soldiers drop their weapons. Hasumi Rijui says it was a mistake to set up an ambush. He takes the captain with him. He says to the soldiers to let the captain go. He tells them that he is going to save the life of their king, whom the captain is confining. He asks if they are still planning to attack even after hearing that. Then he will consider all of them as traitors and show no mercy to them. Hasumi Rijui asks the soldiers what their decision is. The soldiers drop their weapons. The captain calls them bastards to see them dropping their weapons. The girl says to the captain that his scheme has failed. The captain feels pissed off. Hasumi Rijui soon releases the king and subdues the chaos in the palace. The traitor is put behind bars. The investigation into the traitor will continue for a while. Everything is fine now. Hasumi Rijui rests in the room. Nix tells him that he has performed an excellent job. She asks him to think about defeating the ten pillars of the god. She says he can defeat them. Hasumi Rijui starts thinking about the ten pillars of the gods. She tells them the ten gods rule over the ten mythical Rang dungeons. She tells him that Fafnir is one of these gods. Hasumi Rijui asks Nix if her objective is their full annihilation. Nix asks him how he knows that. He inferred it from her attitude. He says she has summoned him here for that purpose. He says that it means she can use the power from the other world to defeat the gods. Nix asks him if he is displeased by that. She requests him to find a way to defeat the gods. Hasumi Rijui says no, he has no problem with that. He says he is a soldier after all. He says it does not matter who is his enemy. He says that to return to his world, for his comrades, for his duty, he will kill the gods. The scene shifts to the next day. Feria appears in a beautiful blue dress and other ornaments. 
She says to Hasumi Rijui that he is looking nice in the suit he is wearing right now. Hasumi Rijui, dressed in a blue formal suit, looks different. He says is that so? He says this type of dress is different from his cup of tea. He tries to adjust his tie. She says this is not good. She comes forward and tries to adjust his tie. She says he should look nice at the party. He adds that after all, it is a party in celebration of the recovery of your highness. The count arrives there. He looks at Hasumi Rijui and Faria together. He says do not make a scene in front of him. Faria notices the arrival of her father and calls him. Count Maribel congratulates Hasumi Rijui. He says his qualification as an Arank adventurer has been approved officially. Faria says that means the application went through right. Count Maribel tells Hasumi Rijui that with this, he can travel the largest part of the continent without any problem. Count Maribel adds that this way, the conquest of mythical Rang dungeons will be smoother. He says the conquest will progress quickly. Hasumi Rijui bows down before Count Maribel and says he is thankful to him. Count Maribel asks what he is talking about. He says it is he who saved his territory, so he should be thankful to him. He says he is grateful that he not only saved his territory, but also helped the king of the kingdom. Count Maribel says this is the least that he can do for him in return for his favors. Count Maribel says this is not enough as a token of thanks for what he did for them. The scene shifts to the party. Hasumi Rijui, with a glass of wine in hand, looks around at the royal party. A soldier bows down before the king. Farai says there is no particular reward for him for saving the life of the king. She looks at Hasumi Rijui to see his response. Hasumi Rijui says it is because the fact of the king's confinement has been kept secret from the public. He takes a sip from the drink and says there is nothing that they can do about that. Faria looks at the drink and thinks about something. Hasumi Rijui brings his hand close to her and asks her to dance. She asks if he is not good at these kinds of things and is not fond of them. He says she has got to look and play the party. He again brings his hand toward him. She looks at him and puts her hands in his hand. The musician plays music on the piano. They dance together and grab the attention of the whole part. Everyone looks at them. People say they look so amazing together. They seem mesmerized in each other's company. Faria compliments Hasumi Rijui's dance moves. She says he can dance so well. He replies that this is something that he has recently learned. Hasumi Rijui says he had no chance to use that skill in the real world. He says he never thought that he would end up using that skill in a place like that. Meanwhile, a man comes and addresses them. He says Faria and Hasumi Rijui, your highness wants to see you. The man takes them to the chamber of the king. He says to the king he has brought them here. He knocks at the door of the king's chamber. They enter the chamber of the king. The king welcomes them. The king says thanks to them for coming. Hasumi Rijui says to the king that there is no need to be so formal and to say thanks. The king asks them to be seated. They sit around a table in front of the king. The king says first of all, he would like to say thanks to them for saving him and his country. The king says he was thinking about what reward should be bestowed on them in return. The king asks them to tell him if they desire something, so that he can grant their desire. Faria says your highness, please do not mention it. She says she is just fulfilling the duty of a knight. The king says then he will bestow the land to the country of the count. He says eventually that land will be her anyway. Faria says it will be her honor to accept that gift from him. She says her father would be happy to hear this. Now the king looks at Hasumi Rijui. He says what about him? He asks what he wants from the king. Hasumi Rijui says he does not want anything in particular. He says she just did what was important in the course of the mission. He says he does not need any compensation. Faria says to Hasumi Rijui that the way he is talking to the king is not appropriate. The king laughs and says sit is okay. He says he does not mind. The king says it is something unthinkable to let someone go unrewarded who saved the country. The king again asks him. The king says he can ask for anything. He asks what he wants to have. He thinks for a moment. He then asks the king if he can get a cartridge to transport the phantasm sword easily. Faria says certainly it would be hard to travel with it. The king says that in that case he has the things that he needs. The king asks his servant to bring the item box. The Freya jumps on her seat to hear the name of the item box. Hasumi Rijui looks at her and asks her what is an item box. She tells him that it is a rank magical tool. She tells him that only a few items with inventory capabilities exist and most of them are owned by the countries and guilds. She looks quite excited. 
Hasumi Rijui asks her to calm down. The man puts a box on the table. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria if this is the item box. She asks him to put it in his pocket and try to extend his right hand. He does as she asks him to do. He then extends his hand and asks her if she is asking him to do it like that. Faria tells him that it is a magical tool that allows its users to use an extra space to place things. She tells him that it will automatically sort out the things and he can take them whenever and wherever he wants to use them. Hasumi Rijui says this will be very convenient. He says thanks to the king for giving him such a valuable reward. The king says it is an item that would be lying in the treasure vault. The king asks him to make better use of it. The king asks him what he will be doing from now on. Faria and Hasumi Rijui look at each other. Then, Faria replies that they will now reach the closest mythic rank dungeon from here. She tells the king that now they will try to conquer the giant god dungeon. The king moves his head and says oh, the one that is located in the elf's village. He says the giant god Grendel rules that dungeon. He protects the holy treasure of the clan's holy water inside the second mythical rank dungeon. The king calls out Sasha, the elf girl. She replies to the king's call. The king commands her to accompany them to the giant kid dungeon. He asks her to act as their guide. The king says to Sasha that she must be tired after their long-lasting mission. The king says to her she must spend some time in her hometown and have some fun there. He says she should distress herself. Sasha bows down before the king and thanks him. She looks at Faria and Hasumi Rijui and says she will guide them to the giant god dungeon. Hasumi Rijui says that is great, they will leave it to her. Faria says thanks to her in advance, they leave the palace. They start their journey toward the giant god mythic rank dungeon on a cartridge pulled by dragons. Faria asks Sacha what her hometown is like. She says there is a whole lot of green. She says there are plenty of animals too. Faria claps in happiness. She says this is wonderful. She adds she is looking forward to it. Hasumi Rijui addresses Sasha and asks if he can ask her something. Sasha says go ahead. He asks her what is an elf. Nick says she is going to explain something like that he has seen in the video games. Hasumi Rijui gets irritated at hearing her voice. He says he already told her that he does not know anything about this kind of stuff. He thinks, why is she so loud? Faria tells Hasumi Rijui that elves are beings that have a long lifespan and pointed ears. Sasha tells him that elves are good at magic and archery. Faria tells him that the elves live in forests. Hasumi Rijui listened to the details with full attention. Then, one by one, their status windows appear and show their race level, skills and titles. However, when it comes to Nyx, the status windows show her name and race only. She feels sad about this. She asks why this always happens to her. She asks why she is treated like this. The Dragon God dungeon arc has been concluded. The second arc begins. The scene shifts to the village of the elves. It is in a lush green forest. The elves can be seen preparing their weapons. Suddenly, they notice a bulge rising from the ground upward. That thing seems ambiguous behind the trees. A huge creature appears out of the ground. Dust and pieces of rocks can be seen scattered in the air. The elves look at the thing and cry out that it is the giant god. They shout the giant god has awakened. The horrible-looking giant god roars with his fiery mouth. The awakening of the giant god creates chaos in the village. The elves run and shout to save their lives. They seem quite tiny in front of the giant god. The giant god puts his foot on the ground and causes a mighty crack. His presence seems destructive to the village, and he crushes things, houses and everything under his feet. His presence seems like a spiral that engulfs everything on the way. Hasumi Rijui, Faria and Sasha reach the forest in which the elves' village is located. Sasha guides them about the way. Faria looks around and says this is a wonderful place. She seems mesmerized by the beauty of nature. Hasumi Rijui says he agrees with her about that. He also looks around to see the beauty of the greenery. He says it took them half a month to reach the place by changing a chain of different carriages. He thinks if they had been deprived of the available means of transport, it would have taken more time to reach that place. Then he says even now, it is quite frustrating that it took so many days to reach there. Faria asks him if everything is fine to see him absorbed in his thoughts. Hasumi Rijui replies nothing he is fine. He asks if things like teleportation formation exist, so why cannot they use them to travel from one place to another? They keep walking towards the village. Faria tells him that magic formation requires quite a huge amount of magic. She says that is why it is difficult to use them for traveling. 
She seems amused at his questions. Hasumi Rijui says he got her point. Sasha says now the village is visible. Sasha tells them that that is their capital city. They look toward it. It is a beautiful city on a gigantic tree. She tells them that it is the spirit tree city. They start walking upward. Faria seems tired. She says though they can see it, it still requires them to walk a long distance. Drenched in sweat, she says the path is quite steep. Sasha looks back and asks her if she wants to take a short break to take some rest. Farrier replies no, she is fine. They start walking again. Suddenly, an arrow flies toward them. The arrow hits the tree instead. Hasumi Rijui looks at the arrow and says this is not a simple arrow. He looks in a direction and asks who is there. He hears the rustle of leaves and notices that someone is running into the forest. Faria looks at the arrow and says it is an arrow that is imbued with magic. She calls out Hasumi Rijui and asks him to be careful. He replies he will be careful. Both Faria and Sasha take their position and look around. Hasumi Rijui runs after the shooter. He says the shooter is quite fast. He says it is difficult to chase him in a cramped forest. He runs fast and says if something like this had happened to him earlier, he would have given up. But now he cannot take that risk. Hasumi Rijui uses his magic to increase his speed. He runs faster to catch the shooter. Meanwhile, the shooter stops and sets three arrows at a time in his bow to aim at him. The arrows fly toward Hasumi Rijui. He notices the arrows coming toward him. He feels like he is stronger than before. He says as his level increased, his physical powers also increased with it. He says if he increases his power, he can catch the shooter easily. He does the same. He increases his speed with the help of the magic and catches the shooter. The shooter tries to free himself from his grip. Meanwhile, Faria and Sasha also reach there. They look at the shooter. He is just a kid. The shooter looks angry. The scene shifts inside the spirit tree village. They go to the house of the spirit tree elder. The spirit tree elder says sorry to them for the attack. He says he is sorry that they have mistreated their guests. He asks the shooter boy to bow down before them and say sorry to them. The boy looks aggressive. He says there is no mistake from his side. He adds he was trying to protect his village. He says it has become quite dangerous around these days. Sasha holds the boy by the hair and asks him to apologize properly. The boy sighs over this. He asks her to free his hair. He says right, he will apologize properly. He asks Sasha not to treat him like a kid. He then bows down before Hasumi Rijui and Faria and says sorry to them. Hasumi Rijui says not to worry about it. He says, more importantly, he should change position between each attack several times and then split them. He says this way, it would become more difficult to locate his position. The boy looks surprised at his instruction. Hasumi Rijui instructs him that this way, it would work well even if he uses it to ambush an intruder. Fares looks at him and asks what he is teaching to a kid. Hasumi Rijui asks why the boy mentioned that it is dangerous these days. He asks the elder what is the matter. He asks him if someone is posing a threat to the village. The elder of the spirit tree village says the truth is that the monsters are overflowing from the dungeon. These days. Faria says it is happening here too. She says the same thing happened in Radom. She says a troll also attacked it. She thinks that some abnormal phenomenon is occurring across the continent. The elder says they are trying to destroy the core of the dungeon, but there is a problem. He says the legendary rank dungeon's entrance has collapsed. He says it is impossible to raid the dungeon now. Hasumi Rijui says his objective is to conquer 10 mythical rank dungeons that exist in this world. He says each mythical rank dungeon is connected to a legendary rank dungeon as its counterpart. He says inside them lies a sacred thing known as the Divine Key. He says the dungeon right here is one of those. Three of them reach the collapsed entrance of the dungeon. They look at it. There is a big pile of collapsed material. Faria says it is completely blocked. She says even if they blow the debris away, it looks like another cave-in will come in. Hasumi Rijui asks Sasha if the cave was like this previously. She replies to him that normally it is cleared. She adds it has happened for the first time that the cave is blocked. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui what he wants to do to see what he thinks. He says they should look around and find another entrance. Has says the elder said that the monsters are overflowing from the dungeon. He says in that case, there should be some hole around there. Suddenly, they hear a whining voice. Faria says what is this voice? They all become alert and look around. Sasha directs their attention in a direction and asks them to see over there. 
they see a group of huge monsters coming towards them. Faria says they are a herd of cyclops. The gigantic-sized, one-eyed monsters come toward them. Sasha says this is bad. She adds they are hearing toward the Spirit Tree Village. They say they have to hold them here and stop them from going to the Spirit Tree Village. Faria gets hold of her sword. Sasha takes out her bow and arrow. Hasumi Rijui takes out a weapon summoning coin. They all seem ready to face the Cyclops. Teria jumps up to the Cyclops and attacks them. Sasha attacks another one with an arrow. Hasumi Rijui jumps onto the branch of a tree. He sits over there and has a look at the whole scenario. He crushes the coin in his hand and summons a weapon. Soon, a rifle appears. He takes it and jumps down from the tree. The rifle disappears. He says that he ran short of the weapon summoning coins. He says there are still so many enemies to deal with. Hasumi Rijui says it will be quite tough to deal with enemies without a short amount of weapon summoning coins. He says he needs to manage most of the enemies with his knife. Nyx asks him to use a phantasm sword. He says the phantasm sword is the sacred treasure that he got from Fafnir, the god of the dragons. He says this item is indispensable for the mission and to go back to his original world. He asks Nyx if it is right to use it. She says there is no problem with using it. She tells him that if he uses a sacred treasure, the power that is stored inside will decrease. She added that the power would be replenished after a while. Nyx then reminds Hasumi Rijui about the S-rank item box. He says that he should try it and give Phantasm Sword a chance. He takes out the Phantasm Sword with the help of the item box. Nyx asks him to imagine that his power is pouring into the treasure. She tells him further that in this way he can take out the power of Rissel. And this way he can activate the power of Rissel. Hasumi Rijui feels as if his power is flowing into the sacred treasure. Afterward, he follows other instructions from Nyx to activate the power of Crisis. Meanwhile, one of the members of the group of Cyclos comes forward and shouts in a whining voice. Hasumi Rijui tries his level best to activate the power of the sword. The sword emits strong light waves and illuminates the atmosphere around it. After continued struggles, he manages to activate the power of the sword. Nyx says this is amazing. She appreciates his efforts and says this is something incredible. Sasha asks him what sort of other world's weapon he uses. Then she asks him why he did not use it this time. He sees a Cyclops attacking him. He takes the sword and gets ready to fight with him. He looks like quite a tiny creature in front of the monster. He attacks the Cyclops with the swords. There appears to be a crack in the sword. Hasumi Rijui was surprised to see a crack in the sword. Nick says it is not her mistake if a crack appears in the sword. She says she has never heard about a crack in an item of holy treasure. Hasumi Rijui takes the sword close to his head. He seems pissed off to see a crack in the sword. Hasumi Rijui asks what he should do now. He says Faria and Sasha cannot target Cyclops from where they are. He says the sacred treasure will not be hot if he waits for it. The Cyclops makes a punch of his hand and tries to crush him under his hands. Hasumi Rijui tries to block his attack with the help of the sword. The hands of the Cyclops and the sword strike each other. In the end, Hasumi Rijui manages to cut the hand of the Cyclops. He knocks down the Cyclops. Faria activates wind magic swordsmanship. Soon, a well-dressed warrior appears over there. He asks if he should give them a hand in the extermination of the monsters. Another warrior appears in the place now. He says they will share the reward equally. Then comes a girl dressed in somewhat the same sort of dress and a big hat. They have weapons with them. They look at the scenario from a height. The newcomers come in contact with Faria, Sasha, and Hasumi Rijui. They ask them if they can help them in the extermination of the monsters. Hasumi Rijui asks them who they are. They wonder why they do not know about them. One of them says they are striving for an edge. The blonde-haired boy from them is Lar, who is an adventurer. He has expertise in swordsmanship, wind magic and fire magic. His level is above 80. The one with braided hair is Roy. He has expertise in wind magic and earth magic. His level is above 75. He says he thinks they are well known. The third one is Meru, who has expertise in freeze magic and is a 70 above level adventurer. Faria looks stunned to hear the name of Striving Edge. Hasumi Rijui asks her if they are famous fellows. She says they are one of the big 3S parties of the continent. She tells him that one of those three parties is one in which their leader inherits a legendary magic tool from generation after generation. She says they are called Dragon Tooth. She says the second group is the one that takes pride in having the largest number of members due to being backed up by a nation. 
She tells him that the second one is called Euroboros Brigade. She adds, and then comes the third party. She tells him that the third party is only formed of three people, and they are known as the Striving Edge. She further tells him that the third party is said to rival the previous two parties. Roy says to Faria that she is pleased to meet a beautiful lady like her. He asks her if she would have a drink with him after that. Faria says she is fine, no thanks. Lar says that the assessment is over the top. He says he is afraid that they are not that special, and they have not performed any of that kind of taste. He adds there is nothing special about them. Hasumi Rijui says in that case, before he completes his sentence, Roy stops him and asks him to wait for a while. He says that as adventurers, they can talk about something. He takes some coins and shows them. He says they should talk about that before starting work. He says it is for the sake of saving the village of elves, so they should not be stingy about the payment. Freya seems offended by his words and demands. Shasha says it is okay. She adds it is their natural right as an adventurer to take their payment. Lar says he is thankful that she is understanding. He says this way, things will go smoothly. Sasha goes close to Lar and whispers in his ear. She asks him if this amount is enough. Lar says all right to the offer. He asks his fellows to start the mission. The three of them look excited. They say they are ready to fight for the sake of Shasha Sama and everyone. Farai asks Sasha how much she has offered them. Sasha whispers in Faria's ear. Faria seems shocked to hear her words. She asks if it will be right to offer them such a huge amount of money. Asha says it is not a problem. She says the elves work abroad for these types of eventualities and problems. Faria asks Sasha if she is providing her services to the Kingdom of Nexus for these reasons. She says yes, and that is the reason behind that. Hasumi Rijui says they should divide the roles and start rounding up the discussion. Lar says everything is simple here. He says they will leave the enemy if they fail to kill them or to drive away them. Cyclops create chaos in the forest. The clouds of fire and smoke can be seen in the surroundings. They jump onto the group of Cyclops. Roy calls out Lar and Merau. Lar and Meru also jump into the groups of the Cyclops to defeat them. All three use their magical powers to fight against the Cyclops. Meru uses her magical power and freezes many of the Cyclops. Faria, Sasha, and Hasumi Rijui look at the scenario from a distant height. Sasha says it looks like their turn will never come. Faria says their skills are amazing. Hasumi Rijui looks at their fighting movements and says they have good team coordination. He says their communication and understanding of each other's intentions are efficient and strong. He says the people who fight like this also exist in this world. Faria asks Sasha what type of magic Meru is using. Sasha tells her that it is freeze magic. She adds it is a special type of water magic. She says very few people can use it. Faria says she is right about that. She says he might not be the prominent one among the three of them, but in reality, he is the strongest of all. Suddenly, they feel the earth shaking. They call out it is an earthquake. Lar calls out to his comrades that it is something quite bad. He says they should retreat for some time. The earth starts tearing with big cracks. They start running quickly to leave that place. Faria loses her balance. She says she cannot maintain her balance and falls into a pit. She says she would not make it. Hasumi Rijui jumps after her to save her. Sasha also does the same. Faria asks them to use magic to reach unscathed. Both Hasumi Rijui and Sasha say okay to her call. They invoke energy from their magical powers. They reach the ground safely. Hasumi Rijui asks them if the two of them are alright. They say they are fine. The Striking Edge team also reaches underground. Lar says the earth shakes and they reach underground. He says that means they are in the area below the elf forest. They find themselves in an unlimited space. They are in the legendary rank dungeon that extends here. They soon notice that Meru is not there. Lar wonders if the cave-in has swallowed him up. Hasumi Rijui asks him to search for him first. Lar says he is sorry about this. Faria asks them what happened. They feel something weird. They look upward. Hasumi Rijui says it seems that they have to leave the search for the ladder. They see a gigantic-sized monster above them. The monster roars in his whiny voice. All of them become alert to see the situation. Lar looks worried to see this thing. He says what the hell this thing is. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria if she knows him. She says she is also seeing this thing for the first time in her life. Sasha says he is a Hekatachir. She tells them that he is the boss of the legendary rank dungeon. 
Roy says he is the last boss appearing already. Sasha asks him to be careful. She says this monster is the real danger. Roy says oh please come on, don't be so serious. Lar looks back and sees a group of Cyclops coming toward them. Hasumi Rijui looks at the Cyclops and says this would be helpful. Lar asks what he is saying. How is that possible? He asks if he means to say this is their end. He commands them to kill the Cyclops and hand over the weapon summoning coins to him. Roy says weapon summoning coins and asks what he is going to do with them. Fry runs toward the Cyclops and says that she got his point. Lar and Roy call her from behind. The Hekatache roars. Hasumi Rijui and Sasha remain in front of him to deal with him. Hasumi Rijui notices that the monster is giving out a strange magical aura. He says this is going to be troublesome. Hekatache punches on the ground and makes a big hole. Sasha attacks him with arrows. She also uses her magical strength to fight with him. Hasumi Rijui feels that the magical attacks are bouncing over him, and they are not hitting him. He says in that case, the physical attacks will work on him. He takes out his knife and runs towards the monster. He runs close to his hand to attack him, but fails to do so as he does not get a chance to do so. He says what it is. Sasha tells him that the monster is a dungeon in itself. Sasha asks Hasumi Rijui to be careful while fighting against the monster. He says so, so that is the reason why she says to be careful. He asks Sasha how they should proceed to kill and defeat that monster. She tells him that for that purpose, they need to destroy the innermost core of the dungeon. She says only then they will be able to kill the monster. She says by deep, she means the back of the monster. Meanwhile, Lar calls them and tells them they are facing a problem in dealing with the Cyclopes. Several woody arrows and pieces of rocks can be seen around them. Faria says she is sorry to tell him that there are so many of them. She says they are being pushed back. He says he is concerned about the stamina of the three of them. He says they have no alternative. They have to break through here first. He takes out the last coin from his pocket. He says this is the last coin, but he cannot sting about it. He quickly crushes the coin and summons a weapon. This time he again summons a rifle. Lar and Roy look back and wonder what sort of weapon is in Hasumi Rijui's hands. Roy says this is not magical stuff. Faria looks at Hasumi Rijui. She thinks if he can kill the dragon and Fafnir with this weapon, then he can also kill the monster with this weapon. Hasumi Rijui aims at the monster and fires a shot. The shot hit the monster. All of them look surprised to see this attack by Hasumi Rijui's weapon. Lar says this is an impressive move. Roy thinks that with something like this, the monster will be easily killed. Faria says it is not over yet. She tells them to dodge. Meanwhile, Lar gets hit badly by the monster. Roy calls out to him to see this. The monster seems unharmed by the attack. He proceeds toward them and growls. Faria says the monster is not harmed even by the weapon. How would they kill him? Hasumi Rijui says so it is like this. He says the monster is managing the physical attacks along with the magical attacks with his magical aura. He thinks it is because his body itself is the dungeon. He thinks of ways an enemy like this will be defeated. Hasumi Rijui looks at the Cyclopes and commands to attack the incoming dodge. Roy asks what they are supposed to do in this situation. The monster moves his hands down and reaches Sasha. He holds her in his hand. She looks like a tiny creature in his hand. The monster takes her upward. Hasumi Rijui says they will chase after them. Roy gives support to Lar and helps him to move. Roy says it is impossible to fight with the monster. He says they cannot leave Lar over there like this and go after them. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria to cover them. She says she understands her point. Roy calls him and asks if he is planning to fight with Hekatacher alone. Lar says it is absurd to fight with that monster. Faria says no, the matter is not like this. She throws weapon summoning coins towards Hasumi Rijui. He catches the coins. She adds if they are talking about Hasumi Rijui, then it is fine as he will manage to fight with him. Hasumi Rijui takes coins and runs after them to fight. Roy asks Faria if he is okay. She says with confidence that there is no need to worry about it. She says he is the one he is charmed by after all. Roy asks her if they have this sort of relationship. She shouts and says no, this is not like that at all. She says that by the words charmed, she means she is impressed by her characteristics and has a sense of appreciation for his adventurous spirit. She thinks that she administered about along with. Then she thinks this is not the time to feel embarrassed about it. Roy says he is aware of that. Hasumi Rijui calls Nix while running. She says yes to his call. 
She asks what he needs. He asks her why the monster kidnapped Sasha. He says that in Lara's case he just attacked him. Nick says it is because she is an elf. She says elves have more power than human beings. She says this might be the reason behind that. He says oh it is like that. Sasha finds herself trapped in a trap inside the dungeon. Hasumi Rijui soon reaches the inner part of the dungeon, where the monster has caught her in a trap. He calls her name. Sasha hears his voice and responds to his call. Sasha tells him that this is the core of the dungeon. He says if he manages to destroy the core of the dungeon, then he will be able to defeat the monster. He says there is a need to destroy the core first. Then he says the monster is in between him and the core. Nyx asks him what he will do now. He says the monster has a high defense against physical and magical attacks. A asks her if there is a way to deal with him. She says there is a way. She tells him that there is only one way, which is to strike by combining the characteristics of magical and physical attack. She gives him an example through an arrow and the magic of fire. Nyx, if it is just him, it would be difficult for him to manage an attack like this. He says no, he can manage. He says it is all within his duties. He tosses the coin in the air. He crushes the coin and summons a bomb. He then activates his magical power, swings his hand in the air, and throws the bomb. The bomb hits the monster in the chest. It seems like a pebble in front of a huge monster like him. After throwing the bomb, he runs toward the monster. Then a big explosion occurs. The whole atmosphere fills with clouds of smoke and fire. The monster growls and gets angrier. Nyx tells him that there are some signs of damage. Nyx tells Hasumi Rijui that more than the damage output is needed. He says that is not a problem. He adds that it is just a test. He moves swiftly and says the real thing will come now. He takes out the second weapon summoning coin. He crushes the coin and summons Barrett M82 derived sub variant. A heavy ammo sniper rifle XM109 payload rifle appears over there. Nyx asks him if it is not the same weapon as before. She says he will not be able to defeat the monster with this weapon. He replies to her, this is a different one. He says both are essentially the same anti-material rifle, but this caliber has been increased. He says this weapon will allow the use of different types of bullets. He takes out the third coin and summons another thing. Nyx asks her what it is. He says it is armor-piercing ammunition. He says a bullet core has been built into it to increase its penetration power. He explains other details about the weapon afterward. Nick says in short, the damage output of this weapon must be higher than the previous one. Hasumi Rijui says yes. He adds that is why he is using this one. He loads the bullet into the weapon and runs toward the monster. He jumps in the air. The monster brings his hand close to him to hold him. Hasumi Rijui fires 25mm caliber bullets. The monster tries to cover his face but in vain. A disastrous explosion occurs as the bullet hits the monster. Black smoke covers the whole area. The monster's mouth starts to bleed. There comes a hole in the trap. It seems that the weapon worked as he desired it to work. The core of the dungeon becomes visible now. Nyx tells Hasumi Rijui that it still needs to be done. She says the monster is not defeated completely. He thinks there are only normal bullets left in the magazine. He says he will be able to defeat it with the help of the remaining bullets. Faria, Roy, and Lar also reach there. Faria calls out Hasumi Rijui. Faria runs toward the monster and attacks him. She diverts the attention of the monster. Hasumi Rijui thanked her for doing so. He takes out another coin and crushes it. He summons some more bullets. Hasumi Rijui uses his magic to increase his speed, moves back to the monster, and aims at the back of the monster. He jumps up and hits the shot on the back of the monster. There becomes a big hole in the monster, visible on both sides. A strange sort of light appears over there afterward. Then Sashes appears and falls from a height. Hasumi Rijui holds her in his arms. She opens her eyes and looks terrified. Hasumi Rijui asks if she is okay. She says she is fine. He looks back and asks how the wounded adventurer is. Sasha covers her head. Nix cheerfully says he did it. She says he has cleared the legendary rank dungeon. Their status windows appear and show their status. Hasumi Rijui asks if healing magic is a different kind of magic that is not related to the main elements, such as water, wind, fire, and earth. Faria tells him that this is a different sort of magic that is outside of four elemental magic. She tells him that the healing magic allows the user to treat the wounded people. Sasha asks Lar to stay still. Sasha uses her magic to heal Lar. 
Faria tells Hasumi Rijui that the teleportation magic that uses formation, or the illusion magic that changes the aspects of things, is stronger in elves than in human beings. Sasha says there are plenty of special magic users among them. She says she is done with the healing procedure. She asks Lar how he feels now. He says he is feeling completely recovered now. He says he is thankful to her for the help. Faria asks Hasumi Rijui to look at a place. She says there is a divine key over there. She says this is the indispensable thing that they require to reach the mythical rank dungeon. Hasumi Rijui tells others that they have come there in search of that item. He asks them if they do not mind if they take it. Roy says going to such a frightening place is not their plan. So they do not want this thing. Lar says splitting the items that appeared after killing the monster with them would be more than enough. Lar puts on his armor again after getting recovered. Meru arrives there and says they cannot take it. He says that would cause a problem for him. He activates his powers and tries to freeze everyone around. Everyone jumps to avoid the attack. Faria, Sasha, and Hasumi Rijui get ready to fight with him. Roy and Lar look at Meru and call him. Lar smiles and oh he is alive. Meru changes his appearance. Lar asks what happened with his body. He turns into a girl elf and says there is no need to worry about it. Meru says this is her real appearance. Her status window shows that she belongs to the race of dark elves and that she has expertise in freeze magic and illusionary magic. Hasumi Rijui looks at her and says so that is the illusionary magic that was brought up earlier. Meru took long steps and ran towards Hasumi Rijui. He notices her movements. He wonders why she is coming toward him. Meru closes her hand in the form of a punch and jumps onto Hasumi Rijui to attack him. He blocks her attack and rather punches her. The moment he punches her, he realizes that it is just an illusion. He thinks this could be troublesome. Hasumi Rijui gets a grip on his knife. Meru again uses her illusionary magic. Hasumi Rijui sees her running toward him. Hasumi Rijui notices her movements. He says even if she disappears, her movement path is possible to predict. He jumps up in the air and throws his knife with full strength. The knife reaches Meru in no time. She manages to block his attack and moves swiftly. She uses her freeze magic and creates big crystals of ice around. She seems impossible to defeat. Hasumi Rijui says she is quite strong to deal with. Meru gives him a look and says that she would not be able to beat him in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation. She laughs and reaches the divine key. She says her objective is to get the divine key, not to fight with him. She picks up the key and looks at Hasumi Rijui. Everyone looks shocked to see her taking away the divine key. She jumps up on a branch. She says as long as she has the key, there is no need to stay here. Everyone looks at her movements. She disappears from the dungeon. Roy calls her and asks her to wait, but she leaves. Lar looks disturbed. He says damn it, what is going on here? Lar again feels pain and is about to lose his balance. Roy holds him and gives him support. Sasha asks him not to overexert himself. She says even though she has used her healing magic on him, it does not look like he has fully recovered yet. Hasumi Rijui asks Sasha if there is any method that they can use to chase Meru. Sasha says the magic will not work on a black elf like Meru, who can use high-level illusionary magic. She says they cannot trace the signs of her strong illusionary magic. Hasumi Rijui asks what is a dark elf. Faria says they are a subspecies of the elf race. Sasha says they are dark-skinned elves and they can use advanced magic. She says it is just that. She says it is sad to tell that they involve demonic powers. She tells them that the Dark Elves live in the Elmi Sacred Mountain, which is located on the opposite side of the forest. She says right now, their interaction with them has come to a halt. Hasumi Rijui asks Striking Edge if they know Maru's real identity. Roy says it is the first time they have heard about that. He says they are fools. He says they have spent five years with her and did not notice a thing about her. Hasumi Rijui asks Lar who suggested going to the elf village. Lar says it was Meru who suggested going to the elf village. Faria says it was strange that she was quite untalkative. She says that in that case, she has been trying to get the divine key since the beginning. She says that means before she completes her sentence. Hasumi Rijui interrupts and says her objective is to get the sacred treasure that lies in the second mythical rank dungeon, Cain's Holy Water. Nick says they need to go after her quickly as she is after the sacred treasure. Hasumi Rijui gets irritated by the vice of Nyx and puts his hand on his ear. He says he is well aware of this fact. Lar asks what is happening here. 
Sasha says it is too dangerous here. She says the dungeon is collapsing, and they need to get out of there quickly. All of them run out of the dungeon. They reach an open plain. Lar asks what is dangerous. Roy asks him not to take so much burden on himself. Lar says he is fine. Roy says what in the world was that? Hasumi Rijui thinks for a while and asks if it happened because he destroyed the core of the dungeon. Faria says no, it is not because of that. She says that even if a core is destroyed, it does not mean that it disappears completely. She tells him that with the vital power, the dungeon revives itself to its previous condition. He says then that it happened because of something different. They stand on the verge of a mountain and think about what they should do now. Suddenly, with a flash of light, Nyx manifested itself. She wonders how this happened. Lar says what is it this time? He wonders to see Nyx. Roy pushes his face with his hand. He says to Nyx that she is as beautiful as a goddess. He asks her about her name. Faria wonders why Nyx Sama manifested. She says she cannot manifest herself unless she is in a place with dense magical power. She says it seems they are already on the path towards the mythical rank dungeon. Nyx says that is right. Roy feels attracted to Nyx. Lar asks him to cut it down. Nyx says in other words, the magical powers in the elf forest have increased to the level of a mythical rank dungeon. Sasha wonders how that could have happened. Nyx says it may be because of the collapse of the legendary rank dungeon. She says it seems that Grendel was neglecting his operation. Hasumi Rijui asks if the giant god Grendel is the same as Fafnir, the god of dragons. Nyx tells him that he oversees all the dungeons in the elf forest. Faria says but why would a god make such a blunder? Nyx says he seems to have been dormant. Sasha says there is a legend about it. She says 1000 years ago, the leader of the elves defeated Grendel. She says the elf forest was birthed because of the wishes and hopes of the elves at that time. She says Grendel has been sleeping ever since to recover from the injury. Nyx says however, with the shock from the dungeon caving in, that he will probably wake up at the same time. They look at each other and try to comprehend the situation. The scene shifts to the god Grendel, who roars aggressively. They hear a noise. They look like something gigantic at a far distance. One of them says, so this is the god Grendel. Sasha says he has amazing magical powers. The atmosphere turns chaotic around. Nyx says no, this is... Before she completes her sentence, Hasumi Rijui asks her what it is. Nyx says that the resurrection of Grendel is incomplete. She says he has not been fully recovered yet. She says he has not revived to his former self. She adds if he is in this state, he can single-handedly destroy everything he sees in his way. It seems as if a gigantic mountain is walking. Faria feels worried about seeing the scene of raw destruction with her eyes. Sasha, Roy and Lar are also somewhat in the same state of being. However, Hasumi Rijui's reaction seems different. He stands still with expressions of seriousness and determination. They can see a sea of fire in front of them. Hasumi Rijui says this is a magic calamity. He says the destruction seems to be the scale of destroying the whole continent. Fire can be seen overflowing on a late area of land. The color of the sky also changes. It seems the whole world is on the verge of destruction. Lar says this destruction is absurd. Roy holds his head in worry. He says there is no way that they can deal with such a situation and come out alive. Faria asks everyone to look at the Grendel. She says everyone Grendel is moving now. Grendel moves with his gigantic sized body and roars. Sasha says this is bad. Hasumi Rijui asks Sasha what he means. Sasha says there is a large size village on the path of Grendel. She says if he continues moving in the same direction, the whole village will be destroyed. Nyx panics and holds her head. She asks what would they do now. She says the divine key has been taken, and on top of that, Gretel has awakened. Hasumi Rijui thinks to comprehend the situation and to make a plan. Faria notices him thinking about something. She asks him what he is thinking about. He says they should forget about the divine key for now. He says even if they try to search for the divine key, there is a great possibility that they will return empty-handed. He looks at the living destruction in the form of moving Grendel. He says right now, their priority should be to save the lives of the villagers. Hasumi Rijui instructs everyone to split into three groups. He says there will be two people in each group. He says he will go with Sasha, leading the way to the lakeside village. He says Faria and Nyx will go to the spirit tree village and ask the elder if there is a way to deal with the giant god. They say they got his point. Roy asks what about them. 
Hasumi Rijui says they will go to the nearest adventurer guild and inform them about the current situation. He says it might be necessary to put together a subjugation party to evacuate the general population. They say yes to his order. Sasha asks Hasumi Rijui if he can take out Phantasm Sword Rissle. He says he can take out the sword, but right now, it is a useless weapon. He shows her the sword and says that a crack appears in the sword while fighting with the Cyclopes. Sasha looks at the swords and says that the crack might be fixable. She tells him that there is a restorer in the Spirit Tree Village. Nick says an elf tool restorer specialist can fix the crack. He says she will take it to the village. She says the magic is quite dense here and she can materialize enough to take objects. Hasumi Rijui, then let's get moving. He says they have to give their 100% to fix the situation successfully. Everyone looks determined to accomplish the mission. The scene shifts to the lakeside village. There is a great destruction over there. A girl elf looks around. She calls her father and mother. It seems that someone just put the whole village on fire. The whole place is filled with clouds of smoke and fire. The girl looks worried. She feels a stark light that seems to be blinding her eyes. She looks upward and sees something horrible. She hears noise around. She covers her ears with her hands. Her vision blurred for a while. There are splashes of fire. Hasumi Rijui reaches the girl and saves her. The girl looks back at him. Hasumi Rijui has his back on her side. He takes his knife out and takes his position. There are weird types of moving branches. Due to light, fire and smoke, it isn't easy to see around. The situation is out of their control. Sasha seems to be taken away by the thunder-like destruction. Sasha manages to save herself. She stands beside a tree and takes out her bow and arrow. She aims at the moving brack-like structures and releases an arrow. The whole scene seems blurred. It is almost difficult to understand what is going on. On top of that, the magical aura is quite strong over there. The elf girl sits silently close to Hasumi Rijui. Sasha succeeds in aiming at the branch-like structure. A piece of that creature flies up in the air. Hasumi Rijui asks the girl if she is fine. Sasha runs toward them. Hasumi Rijui addresses Sasha and says he is leaving the little girl's safety to her. She says all right. Sasha picks up the little girl. Now Hasumi Rijui stands up and says let's see what he can do. He looks at the brack loke structures known as Trant closely. The Trant moves its branch-like limbs in the air in a quick manner. Hasumi Rijui gathered his strength and jumped up the Trant. He says he is sorry to do that, but the obstacle needs to be removed. He takes out a weapon summoning coin. He tosses the coin into the air. He crushes the coin and throws away its pieces. This time he summons an improved version of a portable flamethrower. He fires continuous shots. The big flames of fire rise in the air. That adds to the smoke. They move inside the village and see there are many people. Sasha tries to heal an injured person. Hasumi Rijui asks Sasha if all of them are surviving people. Sasha replies yes, all of them are survivors. She tells him that many of them are injured. He says it seems to relocate them to another place. Many of the injured people are lying on the ground, unconscious and sighing in pain. The little girl comes and holds Hasumi Rijui's hand. She says she is thankful that he saved her life earlier. The girl looks at him with shining eyes and smiles. Hasumi Rijui looks back at her, smiles, and says it is his pleasure. The girl looks at him with hope in her eyes. She asks him if he will save every one of them. She says will he do that for them? One of the elves cries and says they have not seen the giant god. He says this is the end of everything. One of them says the god is angry. Another one adds that they cannot go against the god. He says they cannot go against destiny. The man cries badly. Hasumi Rijui asks them if they live every day of their lives, putting in their best effort. Then they called the wrath of the god. He tells them there is no need to face this type of fate or god. Elves look surprised to hear his words. He looks determined. He says he will defeat that god. On the other hand, Grendel continues to destroy the world around him. He roars wildly. Sasha asks him how he is planning to defeat Grendel. He says he has no idea right now. He says there is no other option but to get on with it at any cost. Meanwhile, Feria and Nyx arrive at the lakeside village. He looks at them and says they reached on time. He asks Feria if she has learned how they can deal with the giant god. She says she has asked the elder of the spirit tree village about that. She shows him a blue crystal and says that it is with this thing that they can deal with the giant god. Hasumi Rijui takes the crystal in his hand and asks what it is. 
Faria tells him that it is a magical crystal. She says it is a mineral with magical powers sealed within it. She says Grendel has not revived properly to his former self. She says he needs magical power to do that. He says that with the use of that magical crystal, they can change Grendel's course. Hasumi Rijui says oh it works like this. He closes his eyes and thinks for a while. He says they are putting off to come up with a plan to defeat him. He says in the first place, they will chase his path with the use of this crystal. He says they will ensure the safety of the inhabitants of this forest. He and Sasha run in that direction. He commands Faria and Nyx to evacuate the village slowly. He says he and Sasha will leave the Grendel away. He holds the crystal tightly in his hand. Hasumi Rijui says Grendel has changed his direction toward them. He asks Sasha if going in this direction is fine. She says there are no settlements there. She says it will be fine if they will get themselves into a large-scale fight over there. Hasumi Rijui says then let's lure him in the safe direction. He says then they will try to defeat him in some way. He says that will be a problem for him. He reaches near him and says it is too late for him to dodge. Sasha takes out her bow and arrow and aims at him. The atmosphere is too smoky and blurry to see something. Hasumi Rijui tries to get balance while resisting the magical aura. Meru also reaches there. Sasha and Hasumi Rijui need to be made aware of her presence here. Hasumi Rijui thanks Sasha for her help. Sasha says this is not a problem. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui notices Meru. He asks her what is the reason behind her presence here. She smiles evilly and says this is Gretel. They reply they know that. She says they will use Grendel's power and fulfill their long-cherished revenge. Sasha says no way she cannot do that. She looks disturbed to hear this. She asks Meru if she is planning to take Grendel to the sacred grounds. Hasumi Rijui says a sacred ground. He asks Sasha's what is a sacred ground. She tells him that it is a place in the heart of the forest. Sasha tells him that a giant magical crystal lies there. She says Meru is planning to use the giant crystal to bring the giant god to complete consciousness. Meru says this is how it is. She says she is looking forward to making this happen. She laughs and says the place where the elves live will be burned and raced to the ground. Hasumi Rijui asks her why she hates elves so much. It seems weird for him to understand her hatred for elves when she is also a member of a subgroup. Meru gets mad at this question and asks why he is asking that. She says what the demon elves and humans have done to the dark elves. Hasumi Rijui says he is sorry, but he does not know the details of the matter. He adds that he has a purpose to defeat Grendel. He says he will defeat Grendel. He says he has to do that. Saying this, both Sasha and Hasumi Rijui start running. Meru says as if she will let them do this. Her eyes blaze with aggression and revenge. Sasha tells Hasumi Rijui that Meru is back with her illusionary magic. Hasumi Rijui asks her where she is. They run as fast as they can to reach Grendel and stop Meru from doing what she wants to do. Meanwhile, hides behind a tree. She looks for a chance to attack them. She holds a knife that seems to be the knife that Hasumi Rijui has thrown at her. She reaches a tree and then jumps for the tree onto Hasumi Rijui with a knife in hand. She says she can see Hasumi Rijui as clearly as day, but he cannot see him coming toward him. She says he cannot get away from her. Hasumi Rijui holds her hand when she tries to attack him. He says he is sorry to tell her that he has already seen it and figured out the matter about her. Hasumi Rijui says that he has kept track of her breathing pattern, the flow of the air, and the sound of the rustling leaves, even if he cannot see her. He puts her on the ground and says that there are plenty of hints that he can use to figure out where she is. Meru gets mad to hear this. She shouts in anger. Hasumi Rijui tights his grip on her arm. He says the moment he figured out her movement pattern, the illusionary magic stopped mattering. Hasumi Rijui pushes her to the ground. Meru says this is impossible. She says he cannot see her through her illusionary magic. She asks him what he did to understand her magical pattern. Hasumi Rijui keeps her on the ground. Sasha reaches near them. Hasumi Rijui tries his best not to let her move. He says the people of this world rely too much on the magic. He says that to use illusionary magic, she has learned close combat techniques. He adds she lacks sufficient experience. Miro asks him what he means by this world. She asks who he is. He replies he is merely a soldier from another world. He takes out another weapon summoning coin. He tosses it in the air and summons handcuffs. He ties Meru with the help of handcuffs. Hasumi Rijui thinks the range of weapons that he can summon with the help of these coins is quite wide. 
He says he will do another thing as well when he gets time. Sasha asks him what he is going to do with her. She asks if he is going to torture her. Meru says to do whatever he wants. He says he does not plan to do anything like this. He says he wants to ask her a question. He asks her why dark elves hate other races too much. Meru gets aggressive at this question. She says all the other races think that they have made a pact with the demons. She adds this is not true. She says other races are jealous of their strong magical powers. Hasumi Rijui puts his hand on her shoulder to calm her down. Sasha says wait for a while. She says to begin with, it was dark elves that drove away the other elves out of the country. She says that was the beginning of everything. Meru says no, that was not the case. She blames Sasha that it was them who used them as their slaves. Hasumi Rijui tries to calm both of them down. He says even in his original world, things like discrimination and strife are quite common. He tells them that the people who helped him when he lost his parents, despite having no connection with me, were people from a different country. He tells them that those people sheltered him and fed him with good food despite having no connection with me. He tells them that his comrades in his current squad have come from different countries. He says previously they were at odds, but now they entrust their lives to each other. He says he does not recklessly pay platitude that they get rid of all the conflicts. He says it is possible to coexist without hating each other. Meru asks him why he is telling these things to him. He replies he is telling her these details because he believes that she is capable of understanding this. Maru makes a bad face and says this is ridiculous. She says to him that he thinks whatever he wants to think, but he is just wasting his time. She says there is no use in stopping her. He asks if she means there are other dark elves like her. Another dark elf runs in a different direction with a magical crystal in her hand. Sasha tells Hasumi Rijui that the direction of Grendel has been changed. She says he will be reaching the sacred grounds. Meru says by tomorrow morning, he will be completely recovered. She says then he will destroy the whole forest. The scene shifts to the spirit tree village where the elder is busy focusing on something. He says the giant god has reverted his course toward the sacred grounds. Nyx, Feria and Hasumi Rijui reach the chamber of the elder. Hasumi Rijui says he wants them to take away all the people out of the forest. The elder says they will follow this suggestion. He says he does not think that they can make it in time. Faria asks what they should do to stop the giant god. The elder says the mythic range dungeon lies just before the sacred grounds. He says the mythical dungeon is a large space. He says if she makes the giant god fall into the dungeon, then his revival can be delayed. Hasumi Rijui adds that in that case, they can defeat him before he revives completely. Nick says there is no way that they can pull that off. She says thick magical barriers surround all the mythical rank dungeons. She says there is no way to remove that layer by using any magic. Hasumi Rijui says that in the present condition, they have no other choice, so they have to make it happen somehow. The elder of the spirit tree village asks Hasumi Rijui if he has a plan. He says yes, he has a plan. He says if magical attacks do not work on it, they should use physical attacks. Faria says so they will do it the usual way. He says yes. He says they will break using modern weapons. The scene shifts to another house in the spirit tree village. Sasha arrives there when everyone else is already there and waiting for her to come. Hasumi Rijui asks her what happened to Meru. Sasha tells him that she has been put in prison. She says she is being compliant now. Hasumi Rijui says oh it is like that. Sasha spreads a sheet on a table and says this is the map of the area. Everyone looks at the map. Sasha addresses Hasumi Rijui and says all he wants to know is the location of the mythical rank dungeon. He says yes he wants to pinpoint it as accurately as possible. Hasumi Rijui says if possible he wants to know the area where bedrock is thinner. Nix asks him what he is trying to do. He says it is not as complicated as she thinks it is. Nix looks at him and tries to understand him. He says they are just trying to trap the giant god into a pitfall, that's it. The scene shifts to the forest, where monsters are overflowing. Some archers and adventurers, along with Hasumi Rijui and his team, try to defeat them. They fight with them by using their bow and arrows along with their magical powers. The reason behind that is the collection of coins. The elf boy knocks down another elf and says it makes 500 coins together that he collected. The boy laughs and says he can do things in a good manner if he makes himself into a task. Hasumi Rijui says he has done a great job. Sasha says he is a grown-up boy now. 
She says now no one would think that he was afraid of foxes to the point of wetting himself in the past. The boy gets mad to hear this. He asks Sasha to forget about this. The elder says there are 500 coins now. He asks Hasumi Rijui if he can manage with them. He says he cannot go as far as to say this will be a success. He says, but he cannot think of a better method than this. He says a large area of the forest will be destroyed by that. He asks if it is okay with them. The elder says they do not have any other option to do this thing. The elder looks sad. He says it is at least better than the destruction of the whole forest. Feria tells Hasumi Rijui that they have finished gathering the coins. Everyone looks at him now to know the next step. The elder says they will be here waiting for the outcomes. He says they are entrusting the matter to him. He requests him to do what he can do for them. Hasumi Rijui says he will do his best. He says they can have his word. Feria says it seems that they are ahead of Meru's comrades. Hasumi Rijui says yes it seems like this. Hasumi Rijui thinks the Dark Elves are planning to take the giant god to the sacred grounds so that he can revive completely by using the magical crystal. He says their objective is to stop the giant god and prevent this from happening. Sasha asks him how they are going to do that. Hasumi Rijui says to wait for a while. He is getting things ready. He puts the bag of coins down on the ground. He uses his magic and takes all the coins out of the bag. The coins start to flow in the air. He crushes the coins with the help of his magic and summons a weapon. Feria asks him if it is not the same weapon, with the help of which he killed the king of the orcs. He says she is right to guess that. He says he wants to bury them in various places in this area. Hasumi Rijui hands over this to villagers and says to bury them as he taught them to do. It seems that he has already guided the villagers about that. The villagers smile to hear his command. Faris came toward Hasumi Rijui and told him that she had finished the task in the assigned area. One of the villagers says he is also done. Another one says he is also almost done. Hasumi Rijui suddenly asks everyone to go down. He also sits down to avoid an attack. An arrow flies toward them and hits a tree. One of the black elves says that their presence has been detected in time. One of them asks if they are being followed. Another dark elf says they have no idea what the elves are doing secretly. He says that they want them to sit quietly until they accomplish their mission. So many dark elves gather around them. Hasumi Rijui says he feels sorry to disappoint them. He adds they have already done with their preparations. He has a coin in his hand that he is hiding behind him. He crushes it and summons a gun. He takes his hand upward and fires a shot. That shot is a signal by Hasumi Rijui. Sasha gets to know that they have finished placing the mines to hear the sound of the shot. She instructs her fellows to get ready to open the fire. The archers get ready with their bows and arrows with fire. Meanwhile, the giant god continues to proceed towards the destination. Sasha commands her fellow archers to fire. The fire arrows move quickly in the air to reach the required place. There are many methods to carry out mine removing operations. One of them consists of the detonation of the landmines with a rocket loaded with explosives for dealing with all of them at the same time. This time, the arrows of elves accelerated with magic and imbued with fire magic will fulfill that role. Hasumi Rijui hands up after giving the signal. One of the elves asks him aggressively what he did. Meanwhile, the fire arrows reach the land mine and a big blast happens. The big clouds of fire and smoke can be seen all around. The whole atmosphere filled with the fire, it seems difficult to see through it. On one hand, a large area of forest was put on fire by land mines. On the contrary, a part of it gets destroyed by the footsteps of the giant god. Dark elves look confused to see this. One of them asks others what is happening around them. They seem unable to comprehend the situation. One of them says to the other to see that the floor of the forest is caving in. The big cracks can be seen on the ground of the forest. Meanwhile, the giant god puts his giant foot on the ground. He opens his mouth and roars wildly. His eyes seem to be burning with fire and anger. As the giant god walks, pieces of rocks can be seen flying around in the air. The scene shifts to the spirit tree village. Nyx addresses the villagers and says the faithful ones will be saved. All of them listen to her attentively. She says there is nothing to worry about now. The people join their hands and tell the goddess they are thankful to her. Feria arrives there and asks Nyx what she is doing here. Nyx seems shocked to see Feria here. The other villagers take dark elves toward the prison. Nyx says to Feria that she thought he would be thankful to her if she helped her in the evacuation of the people. 
She says she has also taken this chance to do some personalizing. She says that in the name of the goddess Nyx, she is trying to convert some of the people to another religion. She asks Faria what happened to Grendel. Faria replies they succeed in making him fall into the mythical rank dungeon. She says for now, they have stopped moving, but they do not know for how much time. She says he is sure to begin moving again. She says they should devise a plan to subjugate him before this without wasting time. Roy arrives there and says it seems there is no solution to stop this yet. Faria says he went to the Adventurer Guild to inform them about the situation. She asks how it went. Roy says it was useless. He says they are just making excuses. He tells him that they are saying that they will send an investigation party to ascertain the situation. He tells her that they have taken the situation in a carefree manner. He adds Lars stayed there to persuade them. He says he came back to report the situation. Roy says it seems better to continue evacuating the place despite counting on the guild. Faria says yes to him. Nyx asks Faria what happened to Hasumi Rijui. She says he is saying something is bothering him. She says he stayed back with Sasha where the giant god is. The scene shifts to Hasumi Rijui and Sasha. Sasha asks. Hasumi Rijui, what is bothering him? He says Meru did not have the divine key with her. Sasha says she could have left with one of her comrades. Hasumi Rijui says probably. He says the fact that they are not here means they are not aiming at the sacred treasure. He says Meru went as far as disguising herself by using illusionary magic. He adds she spent five years with a striking edge just because of the key. He says there must be a reason behind that. Sasha says the divine keys are items that are meant to dispel the strong magic barriers that surround mythical rank dungeons. She tells him that the keys have complicated formulas interwoven in them, and they can even detect and identify their users. Hosumi Rijui asks her what she means by detect and identify. She says the keys take magic power readings from their users and the people around them and grant them access to the dungeons. She says other people besides them would not be able to enter as they please. Hasumi Rijui says to her that she knows a lot. She says she read it at the royal family's library. He thinks it is similar to how biometric authentication works. He says they restrict users and also give access. He asks her to take him to the magical crystal. He asks her what it is. He says he does not know too much about magic. He asks Sasha if it is possible to get control over the giant god by changing the formulas of the divine key after completely restoring him to his former state of being. Sasha starts thinking about it. The scene shifts to the sacred ground where there are three dark-skinned elves are standing and talking to each other. Hasumi Rijui and Sasha reach there. Sasha says they are here in the ground, the dark elves. The dark elves look back and say so they are found out. The dark elves take out their bows and arrows, they aim arrows at Sasha and Hasumi Rijui. They say they would not let them interfere. Both of them jump up to avoid the attack and run quickly. One of the dark elves says to the other to leave the matter to him. He uses plant manipulation magic and takes out branches like structures to catch Hasumi Rijui and Sasha. Sasha's notices there are many branches like structures resulting from plant manipulation magic. She thinks she cannot evade all of them. One of the dark elves laughs and sees her struggling. He says he served right to the shitty elf. He asks her to come here and gets herself impaled. Sasha gets badly hit by the magic of the dark elf. She falls to the ground. Hasumi Rijui uses his magic and manages to make her reach the ground unscathed. Then he reaches her in no time. He picks her up and asks her if she is alright. The dark elf gets mad to see this. He asks Hasumi Rijui what sort of magic he used just now. The Dark Elves say they need not worry about who they are. They say they are done with their preparations. The scene shifts to the Spirit Tree Village. Nyx says to everyone not to push others. She asks them not to talk and run. Nyx bows on the floor. Feria asks her what she is doing. Feria feels something weird. She suddenly feels drained out. Roy says something is bad. Nyx says it is such a tremendous magic. She tells them that after all the effort they put it seems useless. She says the giant god has been awaking completely. The scene shifts to the sacred grounds. The dark elf throws the divine key on the magical crystal. A sharp light comes out of the crystal. Both Hasumi Rijui and Sasha cover their eyes. The earth starts to shake. It seems that the giant god has awakened. The big cracks appear on the ground. The giant god takes his hand out of the ground. Hasumi Rijui looks at that and says this is the arm of the giant god. He says the giant god has already arrived here. 
Sasha says it is the same as with the Hecaton chair. She says the mythical rank dungeon is physically becoming the giant god. Hasumi Rijui says he altered the nearby terrain and turned it into a body of his own. The giant god comes out of the ground. He moves towards the magical crystal. He holds the magical crystal in his hand. He growls wildly. The dark elves look at the giant god and smile. They say, oh great god, take out the power of this magical crystal and revive. They say revive and become the tool to fulfill their long-cherished desire, become the tool for their revenge. Hasumi Rijui shouts at the dark elves and asks what they are doing. He asks them if they want to die. They laugh and say death is not something that should be feared. One of the dark elves jumps into the mouth of Grendel in an attempt to satisfy the hunger of the giant god. The other one smiles and says that they are meant to be mere sacrifices since the beginning. He looks at the divine key and says it is in this way. He says that person will inherit our will and take care of the rest. Sasha moves her head in the other direction to avoid seeing all of this. Hasumi Rijui says they regret being there as it is very dangerous over there. They start running when they see the giant god coming in the same direction where they are standing. The giant god revives completely. He closes his fist and growls with his full strength. The scene shifts to the spirit tree village. Nyx tells Feria that the Ten Pillar God possesses an incommensurable amount of magic. She says that magic power has been kept to a level that the outer world can manage. She says this is precisely the reason that this power is confined in the dungeons. She says if that power leaked out of the dungeons, she needs to complete her sentence. Feria asks her what would happen if the magic power leaked out of the dungeons. Nyx cries and says she cannot even imagine it. She cleans her tears and says if it happened, it would be enough to remove the whole continent from the world with ease. Fairy says oh no. She seems worried to hear all this. She asks Nyx if they can do something to stop it. Nyx says she does not know any method to defeat an existence that harbors that magic power. Fairy tries to console Nyx and says it is too soon to give up. Hasumi Rijui and Sasha reach the village. Faria sees him and asks if he has a plan. He says he is not sure yet. He says he wants to ask something from Meru. The scene shifts to the prison, where Meru sits in silence and thinks about her past events. She reminds us who she cried in front of Wan Chan, why Luria was executed, and who was part of the conditions for them to live. Her face seems emotionless and still. Wan Chan says it cannot be helped since Luria arbitrarily trespassed into the water fountain of the elves. Meru reminds herself of crying bitterly in pain and aggression as a child who lost some loved one. She reminds me why Lura did this because there was little water in their village, while in the elves' village there was a great amount. She remembers Luria crying for help when an elf killed her with a sharp weapon. She fails to get over the scene of Luria's death. She opens her eyes. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui enters the prison. Meru asks him why he came here. Hasumi Rijui takes out the key and unlocks Meru's handcuffs. Sasha, Nyx and Furia stood at the door and watched Hasumi Rijui doing this. Meru rubs her hands and asks Hasumi Rijui what he wants. He says he has said earlier that she is someone capable of understanding and reasoning. He says he wants to ask her whom she referred as the person. She says she is wondering what he is going to ask and what reason she has to answer. Hasumi Rijui says even if the whole continent is to be obliterated, she says this is ridiculous. She asks him to stop with these useless threats. Nick shouts it is the truth. Meru is shocked to hear this. She feels something she says the kind of magic she is feeling cannot be. She leaves her sentence incomplete. Nick says, but it is true. She tells her that she is a goddess. Nick says she just does not know how dangerous the ten pillars of God are and the risks associated with them. She says they hold the power to grant any wish. She says, in other words, they hold the power to shape, bend, and recreate the whole world. She adds that in that case, it is also possible for them to transform everything into nothingness. Meru says it is said that the gods cannot lie, so it must be true. She asks what about this, she shouts and says it is fine for a world like this to be destroyed. She says that is what she and her comrades think. She looks at Sasha and says this is what the bastards made them think. Sasha wonders why she is saying this. Meanwhile, Roy arrives and says something serious has happened. Feria asks him what it is. He tells them that a large horde of monsters has appeared suddenly. He seems breathless and drenched in sweat. Everyone runs out of the chamber, where there is a prison inside. They look down from a height to see the situation. They see Hecatonchair, who is walking freely. 
they wonder how he appears again when they have defeated him. Nyx tells them it is a part of the giant god that has materialized when he altered it using the magic power. Nyx says the forest itself is brimming with the power of magic. She says the forest has itself become the giant god. Nick says this is how he manages to bring forth a large army. They see a huge bulk of monsters overflowing in the forest. Maru notices that Hasumi Rijui is thinking something. She asks him what is his plan. She asks him if he is still planning to fight against something like this. Hasumi Rijui says of course he is planning something. He says there is no reason to despair. He looks determined to fight against the bulk of monsters and the giant god. Hasumi Rijui summons another weapon. He lays down on the roof of a house and aims at the monster. He targets Cyclops at first. He uses an explosive bullet to kill the Cyclops. An explosive bullet is a type of shell that is designed to fragment into shrapnels, killing and wounding enemies in large numbers. By cladding it into magic, it can kill a large number of monsters all at once. That is the reason that Hasumi Rijui decided to use it this time. Hasumi Rijui uses explosive bullets and knocks down so many monsters in no time. The elves collect weapons summoning coins for him. Two of them bring a bag of coins to hum on the roof of the house and say they are placing the bag of coins here. Hasumi Rijui says he is thankful for their service. One of the elves asks him if it is time to switch the position. Hasumi Rijui says he will leave it to them to collect the weapon summoning coins in the area he is going to attack. The elves say they got his point. All the sides surround the spirit tree village. They say they divided the area into four quadrants and managed to deal with the situation, but there is no way that they can keep this up for a longer time. Hasumi Rijui thinks there is nothing else that they can do. Then he thinks about the report that Nyx is intended to bring to him. Meanwhile, Nyx arrives over there. She calls him. He asks him how her observation has gone. She says it was horrible. She says it is goddess abuse to make her go up close to the giant god and look for his weakness. She is not happy with the assigned task. Hasumi Rijui says he is sorry to make her do such a dangerous task. Then he asks her about the report and says now he would like to hear what she found out. Nyx puts her hands on her face and says oh, she just got appraised by Hasumi Rijui for the first time. Faria and Sasha enter the room and say they will be playing his place to fulfill the attacking role. Hasumi Rijui says, please do that. He adds he will be counting on them. He asks them to be very careful while performing this task. Hasumi Rijui gets back to Nyx and asks her what she has learned about Grendel's weakness. Nyx says Grendel's weakness is the dungeon's core. Hasumi Rijui says he is the same as Hecatonchair. She adds that the core lies very deep inside Grendel's body. She says that in that case, a simple attack would not be enough. Hasumi Rijui thinks that to deal with such a great body, even the armor-piercing ammunition would fall short. He says it would be easier if he summons a tank. Nyx asks him what they will do now. Hasumi Rijui says, just as he planned, he is going to have a one-hour nap. He asks Nyx to wake him up after an hour. This makes Nyx wonder. She asks him if he is going to sleep just now. She looks back and sees him asleep. The scene shifts to the forest. The elves say they have collected so many coins. They say they should go back now. When they are about to leave the place, one of them asks others to look in that direction. A cyclops appears from that direction. The cyclops runs after some people. One of them tells others that the people are from the lakeside village. He says they need to save them. Two of them stay quiet at this. The one who tells them starts to run in that direction. He says if they do not want to join, he will go alone. They call him and ask him to stop. Meru reaches the prison where the elves keep her comrades. They ask her to leave them there and work under the person for the cause. She returns to the forest. There, she reaches the same place where the lakeside villagers are at the target of the cyclopes. The boy stands between the cyclops and the lakeside villagers with his bow and arrow in hand. The little girl behind the boy cries bitterly. The boy takes out an arrow and asks the monsters to have this. He fires many arrows one after the other, but the monsters seem unharmed. The monsters laugh at him. The boy feels frightened to see this. The cyclops comes forward and raises his hand in the form of a fist to crush them. Both the boy and the girl shout no and close their eyes in fear. Meanwhile, Meru reaches there and uses her freeze magic. She throws crystals of ice and makes the cyclops freeze at the point where he is standing. The boy opens his eyes. They look at the dark elf standing between them and the cyclops. Meru asks them to get out of the place quickly. The boy wonders and is about to say something, 
But before he says anything, Maru again asks them to go. She says to do it before she changes her mind. The boy takes the girl on his back and runs away. Maru feels pissed off. She asks herself what in the world she is doing. She wonders why she saved the elves. The scene shifts elsewhere. One of the elves says he will take the wounded one. He asks if there is someone who can use healing magic. The elf takes some wounded fellow on his back and enters a room. He asks someone if the room is empty. He says he wants to do some treatment over there. He asks the man what he is doing at a time like this. The man says he cannot see that he is preparing Phantasm Sword Wrestle, which is entrusted to him. Meanwhile, the man gets some idea and says this trick should work to accomplish the task. He seems quite happy. He holds the sword. The scene shifts to Meru. She keeps struggling with the monsters. She uses her freezing magic and applies it on so many monsters. She feels it is difficult to get away from the monsters. She says these monsters have a great sense of smell that she cannot get away even by using her illusionary magic. The monster raises his hand toward him and tries to attack her. Meru uses her magic to block his attack. But still, she gets injured and falls to the ground. She feels regretful. She says she is dying just because she saved two kids. She sits in front of a tree to normalize herself. She thinks this is so unlike her to do things like this. The monster is still there. She holds her arm with her hand and feels pain. Meanwhile, Faria reaches out to help her along with Sasha. Faria takes out her sword and Sasha gets hold of her bow and arrows. They say to the monster it is not over yet. Meru asks Sasha what she is doing here. She says Led tells her how she saved two of them. Sasha says she is thankful for her help. Meru feels pain in her arm. Sasha asks her to show her wounds so that she can heal them. She sits beside her. Meru asks if that human is okay by himself. Meanwhile, Lar and Roy reach there. Lar says he is not alone. Faria feels happy to see Lar and Roy here. She says if they are here, that means they must have succeeded in bringing a rescue squad here. This is quite satisfying for her. Lar says yes, they succeeded in doing so. He says he somehow managed to persuade the guild master. Then he rubs his forehead and says he guessed that he has no choice other than this. Lar tells them he has brought 20 A-class adventurers with him. Then he looks at Meru and stops talking. Roy pats his shoulder to calm him down. He says let's keep the other details for later. He says in the first place, they need to get through this situation alive. He says they cannot fight with each other at this time. Lar says that is right. The adventurers have already started fighting with the monsters. One of them hits strongly on the hand of the monster. The blood gushes out of the wound. Another adventurer jumps onto the monster and says he can take a short break. They will take his position. Another adventurer opens the Book of Magic and starts to cast a spell on the monster. The monsters are attacked by heavy flames of fire. One of the adventurers feels the situation is absurd. Though they killed so many of the monsters, there are still many. She says there are so many that there is no end to them. She adds the situation is even worse than being inside the deepest part of the dungeon. Another adventurer says this is bad. They are coming from another side too. Faria asks them to get down for a while. She uses her water magic. She swings her sword in the air and throws a magic aura onto the monsters. Then she jumps up onto the monster and attacks them with one after another strikes. In no time, she knocks down so many monsters and gets back to the ground. The other adventurer says this is amazing. One of them says even with that much power, she is just a C-rank adventurer. He asks how is that possible. He adds she must be joking. Faria says she is thankful for the compliment. She smiles to hear the compliment. She thinks she wonders if she has just reached close to Hasumi Rijui, just a little bit in power and fighting skills. Meru stands up and says the giant god is coming. She feels the magical aura of the giant god. The scenario starts to turn into chaos. The speed of the wind fills the air with dust. It becomes difficult to see anything. The adventurers run out of the place. Some of them see the giant god from a distance and ask each other what is that thing. They say it is impossible. To deal with something like that, one of them asks Meru if it was Grendel's magical attack. She says no. She says that was just a result of swinging his arm. She says his next attack will come soon. Grendel raises his arm to punch on the ground. One of the adventurers says this time, he is going to attack them directly. The giant god hits his hand on the ground. The adventurers fly like tiny creatures, and along with them, small pieces of rocks also spread into the air. 
Feria looks upward, and there are cracks in the ground below her feet. Meanwhile, Hasumi Rijui reaches there with the phantasm sword Rissle. There appears a big hole in the ground where the giant god hid it. One of the adventurers says he diverted the upcoming attack. Feria looks at Hasumi Rijui and smiles. Hasumi Rijui gives a heroic pose. Flashes of light come out of the phantasm sword Rissle. Feria looks at the sword and asks him if they are already done preparing it. Hasumi Rijui says it is a temporary fixation. It seems that the weapon summoning coin summons the sword and it is not the real one. Meanwhile, Nyx arrives there she calls out Hasumi Rijui. She asks him to have a look at the sword. He asks her if she has prepared it. She says the person right there has done the perfect job in repairing it. The man says it is not perfect. It is just a temporary repair. Hasumi Rijui says to the man still his magical power is unique. The man says oh it is so. The man says he took a look at the residential power in the sword. He says there are partial signs of an element that he had never seen before. Hasumi Rijui asks what he means by that. The man says he means the sword is quite unusual if he puts professional jargon aside. Hasumi Rijui asks the man if this is the reason why it cracked. The man says probably. The man asks him not to forget that all he did is just mending with the use of magic. He adds he must be careful. The man says to Hasumi Rijui not to deal any physical attack with it or let it suffer its effects. The man says what is left at his disposal to use are only the types of magical attacks that release or emit something. Hasumi Rijui says that it should not be a problem if it is an attack that he has not used long ago. Hasumi Rijui tells Roy and Lar that some elves are in the middle of reaching any shelter there. He tells them that he wants to protect those villagers until they reach the Spirit Tree Village. He says they will join the defense efforts afterward, as per Nix's indications. Lar says he got his point. Roy says let's get moving. Hasumi Rijui then turns toward Meru and says now he wants. Before he completes his sentence, Maru says she knows he wants to know about the person. Hasumi Rijui asks Meru if that would be alright with her. She says that the so-called person is their queen. Feria asks if she means Dark Elves Queen. Maru says yes. She says that her comrades wrote a magic technique on the divine key that they fed to the giant god. She says it is a technique to control the giant god from the outside. Maru shows them a magic charm. She says the technique will react to this magic charm. She adds only their queen can activate it. Hasumi Rijui asks her if her role is to deliver it to the queen. She says yes it is right. Then she takes out a knife and tears the charm into pieces. She says he was assigned that task. But now she cannot find justice and righteousness in that long-cherished revenge anymore. She bows in front of Hasumi Rijui and says she knows it is selfish of her. He asks Hasumi Rijui to defeat the giant god. The scene shifts to the chamber of the Dark Elves' queen's chamber. She seems mad at Maru. She says Maru is betraying them now. The queen instantly uses her magical power and reaches the place where all of them are standing. Everyone panics to see her. Sashsa wonders where she came from. Feria wonders if it could be teleportation magic. She says, but there is no magical formation. Feria says it is a magical power. She says just being near her makes her feel dizzy. Maru says there are no remnants of the body left in her. She adds she is just a power accumulation of magical power. The queen says well, it is fine. She says her objective is still unchanged. Maru asks her if she is planning to fuse with the giant god directly. She asks her to stop. Meru tries to prevent this from happening. The queen is not in a mode to stop doing that. She creates a strong magical spell. A lot of branch-like structures come out of the ground and start to move upward. Hasumi Rijui asks her to wait. The breaks-like structures cover her completely and take her down to the ground. All of them feel shocked to see this. Hasumi Rijui asks Meru what this is. She tells him that the fusion has started. The red light sparks out of the small patches of the ground. The giant god growls. The fusion remains in process. The giant god seems angry. He growls aggressively. Roy and Lar look at the sky and wonder if they are dreaming, or if it is happening in reality. Nyx falls to the ground in despair and says this is the end. She says this is the second mythical dungeon. She looks at the transformation after fusion and says this is the guardian beast of the giant god's dungeon. She says this is Grendel's ultimate replicating form. The scene shifts to the spirit tree village. There is a bulk of cyclopes there, overflowing in the whole village. The adventurers keep fighting with them with magical spells and fire magic. 
one of them shouts keep firing fire at them and do not let them get too close. Lar says that the lively monster bastards keep coming on them. Roy says he wonders how long they will be able to stop them. Hasumi Rijui, Faria and Sasha reach the place. He asks them if all of them are safe. They replied that yes, they were fine. Hasumi Rijui asks them where Nyx is. Lar and Roy look around to find her. The other adventurers also do the same to find her around. But no one can locate her. Meanwhile, her voice comes from a direction. All of them look at her. She says look, everyone, all of us are ready to go to heaven. She says despair is just a dream. She lunatically starts saying the slogan dread is equal to salvation. Dread is equal to salvation. Sasha throws water at her. She comes to her senses and says what even she is talking about. Nick says she is sorry she lost her composure and freaked out. She says the fact that the situation is hopeless still holds. Hasumi Rijui asks Nyx if there is no way to defeat the giant god. Farius says he is the dungeon's boss who protects the mythical rank of the dungeon's treasure. She adds there must be a way to defeat him and conquer the dungeon. Nyx says there is a way. She says at first they have to destroy the third eye that is on his forehead. Hasumi Rijui says they have to do to release him from the control of the Queen of the Dark Elves. Nyx says yes. Nick says if they do not do that, then their aim to destroy the deepest part of the dungeon will not be fulfilled. She adds they will not be able to defeat him and win the dungeon. Faria starts to think about the third eye of the giant god. Nick shouts that she already knows that it is impossible to do that. She raises her finger toward the giant god and says this place cannot be reached. She says they cannot reach the third eye even by jumping via magical power. She says she cannot fly this higher. Furia thinks for a while and says, besides if they somehow manage to reach there, there is no way that they can destroy the deepest part of the dungeon. Nyx holds her head and says this is why she is saying that this is the end. Hasumi Rijui tells everyone to calm down. He says how about doing this? He just says these words everyone looks at him with full attention. He tells them the plan. Nyx says in that case, things must work fine. Sasha asks Faria if she understands what they are talking about. Faria says only half of it. She adds that if it is Hasumi Rijui's plan, it will work for sure. Sasha says she has a feeling that everything will turn out okay somehow. They make a pile of the weapon summoning coins. Hasumi Rijui asks if these are all of them. Lar says yes, he adds this is quite a lot. Roy says their resources to produce them were appearing non-stop after all. Faria asks him what he is going to summon with them. He says it will be something that will allow them to fly up to the top of the giant god's head. This time he summons the attack helicopter X665. They get into the helicopter to fly high up to the head of the giant god. Faria seems frightened from the height. He asks her if she is fine. She replies yes, somehow she is managing to be fine. Hasumi Rijui thinks that he somehow manages to bring it with a thousand weapon summoning coins. He says he has only done some practical training courses. He says he is glad that he has some piloting experience as he was absorbed in thinking. Faria calls him to tell him that they have reached close to the giant god. He takes out his gun and attacks the god. The helicopter seems like a small bird compared to the giant body of a giant god. But the way it works makes Faria say that it is amazing. They soon reach close to the head of the giant god. The giant god opens his mouth and growls. As he growls, a heavy amount of fire releases out of his mouth. The giant god attacks them. Hasumi Rijui says the attack is coming. He adds they have to come out. The heavy fire attack by the giant god destroys the helicopter in no time. The fire attack tears the helicopter into small pieces. Both Hasumi Rijui and Faria jump out onto Grendel's giant body. Faria says this part of the was successful. Hasumi Rijui says yes. The scene shifts to the spirit tree village. The elder asks Nyx if she needs a heavy metal as long as possible to defeat the giant god. Nyx says are there any. Laud tells her that he knows about one of this kind. He says once he was outside the entrance of the mythical rank dungeon. Before he completes his sentence. Sasha interrupts and says that she has asked him not to go there many times. She seems angry to hear that. Nyx stops her and says this is not the right time to scold him. Nyx asks him to please tell her about that place. Laud says right, he will tell her about that place. Nyx says it seems that they can manage to save the things on their end. She says she wonders if things are going smoothly with Hasumi Rijui and Faria San or not. The scene shifts to the top of Grendel's head. They see so many of them here. 
It seems to be the effect of illusionary magic. Hasumi Rijui says oh an unexpected welcoming party is there to welcome them. Hasumi Rijui says they neither left an escape route nor have time to waste here. Foria says this does not change what they come to do. Hasumi Rijui says that's right. He says they will proceed as planned. He takes out his knife and Foria takes out her sword. Both of them run towards the monsters. Hasumi Rijui says there are so many enemies. Faria says yes, there is no end to them. They stand back against each other while fighting. Hasumi Rijui notices the movements of the monsters. He says their movements are sluggish. He says they seem to lack the ability to think independently. He tosses a weapon summoning coin in the air and says in that case he needs to summon a weapon. This time he summons an M48 stun grenade. He throws it toward the monsters. He asks Faria to close her eyes and cover her ears. The moment the stun grenade touches the ground, a massive explosion occurs. The monster gets confused by the noise of the explosion. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria to take advantage of the moment. Both of them run. He tells Faria that Grendel went past them. He thinks about the next move. He sees a threat at Faria. He asks Faria to dodge. Faria tries to avoid the attack. She struggles with the help of her sword but ends up getting injured. Hasumi Rijui asks Faria if she is fine. Faria asks him to continue moving. She says she will catch up with him shortly. She tries to stop the flow of blood with her hand. She asks Hasumi Rijui to believe in his comrade. She manages to smile in pain and looks at him. Hasumi Rijui closes his eyes and says all right, he will be waiting for her. Hasumi Rijui leaves Faria behind and moves towards the core of the dungeon. He looks around and says there is no time left now. He tosses another coin and crushes it to summon a weapon. He says he will defeat the giant god right away. He takes hold of the heavy weapon and starts firing constantly. He tries his level best to destroy the core of the dungeon. There are so many branch-like moving structures there because of the fusion of the Dark Elves Queen. Hasumi Rijui says things look so damn bleak here. He adds this is what he can say about a situation like this. Then he looks at something and smiles with peace. There are big flashes of blue magical power that can be seen everywhere. It seems that Faria is back to fight along with her comrade. Meanwhile, Faria reaches the third eye of the giant god, swinging her sword with warrior-like courage. She says it went just as Hasumi Rijui planned. Faria reminds Hasumi Rijui's plan. He told them that the giant god was under the control of the queen, and she would be bound to defend herself as efficiently as possible. He said that she would be wary of the unusual nature of his attacks. He said the queen would be thinking that the humans of this world are unable to attack with anything besides magic. Faria comes back to the present. She says the last attack has depleted her magical powers. She tightens her grip on the sword and says she still has her sword with her to attack. She took her sword high upward and thrust it into the third eye of the giant god with her full strength. 